We're going to do three talks this morning. I think this is such a huge topic, the concept of SIRS. I'm going to use the phrase SIRS. SIRS stands for Chronic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. I'm going to use that a lot this morning, so you just know what that acronym means when we, when we cut the chase. We're going to do three talks. First of all, the physiology, which is a little bit of a heavy science talk. So for those of you who need coffee early, that would be a good time. I have no hurt feelings if anybody catches up on sleep, but the first talk is really a heavy science talk and a deep dive into the physiology. There's always somebody who likes it, and always somebody who leaves me a little note saying, you just blew me away, I couldn't understand the word you said. Pardon me, we're trying to balance that. The second talk is how to make the diagnosis and walk through all the steps of diagnosis. And the third talk is how to treat, and basically how to do all the treatment processes. What we don't have is a talk on how to remediate your homes. And we actually have some resources, and we give some people the idea about that. There's nobody in Milwaukee yet, but I think with a, it's, this is going to soon become a huge topic for people to talk about their homes. And just by way of introduction, I live in a 75-year-old or 70-year-old moldy Brookfield trilobite. And so I know what I'm talking about. And I remember 40 years ago when we moved in, signing a paper saying we knew that the basement was wet. Which means our daughter says, Dad, don't worry about fixing up the house. It's just a tear down. It's so discouraging. You take such good care of your house. You love your house for all these years. And your own daughter says it's just a tear down. Okay, so the first talk is going to be what's happening, what is SIRS, what's going on with it. And I want you to understand over about the next 45 minutes, 50 minutes, and I'll try to leave about 10 minutes to give us a chance to go over questions. And so we'll be out of here by, knock on wood, 11.30, just as the sun comes out. Oh no, as the snow starts. Okay. So what's the physiology of inflammation? understand what SIRS means, chronic inflammatory response syndrome, and give some understanding of the pathway of that process. So this is sort of the boring understanding. But on the other hand, for me, it's fascinating. This is my house. What do you see on that wall? It's coming up. What's it doing coming up? Why is there mold there? What's what? Where, why is there mold there? See that baseboard heat? This is a 70-year-old house. Baseboard heat means you've got copper pipes embedded in cement underneath. My clue was, as we had called the plumber twice in the last year, for there's water in the baseboard, you know the bloop, 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 bloop sound you get when your pipes are have water in them? And we call the plumber twice to flush the air out. And we flush the air out, and for a couple days it's good, and then suddenly there's air again. How come it filled up with air so quickly? We didn't realize that until retrospective. But when you peel off that wallpaper, we had to take all that out. So we had to call in a contractor and have the whole thing encased in plastic, and they had to, duh, 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 you know, a big, huge mess to clean it up. But there was a broken pipe down in the cement down there. And it turned out the wood up to about here was all rotten. All had to be carved out and taken out and put new stuff in, you know. Uh, but you'll find, this is not my house. This is another picture. But this is the kind of thing you'll see in basements. And you can find, if you type in to Google and look up pictures of mold, you can find all sorts of entertaining pictures. But probably uh, many of you have something like this in your home. But the estimate is that 50% of American buildings measure as moldy buildings. And we're going to teach you how to measure them exactly later, how you can get your own house measured. So what is SIRS? It's chronic inflammatory response syndrome set off by many <coughs> environmental toxins. There are many toxins that will set it off that are specifically named toxins. Uh, mold is the probably 90%? So nobody knows for sure yet. We This is something for future research. Uh, but you just heard me talk about ciguatera. And ciguatera is in a dinoflagellate in, uh, in reef fish. Uh, Fisteria probably comes from another dinoflagellate. Uh, Lyme disease, brown recluse spider bites, multiple insect stings. Uh, 
some people are thinking that maybe Cipro, the antibiotic Cipro sets off. We're not sure why, but you see people who get who get Cipro and they get floxin, floxin response, and that that lasts for months and years, and they get treated as though they're crazy, and uh, that that may be something that sets it off. This, there's ripe opportunity for huge amounts of research on figuring out what's setting off this chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Uh, oops, wrong direction. So when you talk about red tide, for those of you who heard of red tide, just as you can see, red tide can be really red. It can be, you know, pretty dramatic. Uh, and here's hysteria. Hysteria is something you might not have ever heard of. How many people have ever heard of Richie Shoemaker, how he stumbled onto this? A couple of you heard the story? Okay, then let me share the story with the rest of you so you've heard. Uh, Richie Shoemaker was a family physician in Pocomoke, Maryland, in Tidewater, Maryland. And what was going on in his what was going on in his community was that, five miles away from Pocomoke. There was a massive fish kill going on, and the river was <coughs> filled with dead fish. But Pocomoke is five miles away from the water. There are some very lazy rivers, these tidewater rivers that are going through the community. And 150 people in town got sick, or a large number. It was enough for the Washington Post to run an article on it, and it was enough for the CDC to come to town and say, they're not sick. Nothing's wrong with them. And then Johns Hopkins, being the local medical school, public health school, they came and took a look at those 150 people and said, nope, nothing wrong with them. And there's a hundred, they're all his clients, they're his patients, they're his friends and neighbors, and he, know, he knew them. And one of them came to him, and if you notice on your SIR symptom list, you'll see the diarrhea is down there. She was having mm, 20 poops a day. It was driving her crazy. She was on the pot all day long. And she had a lot of other symptoms, and he said, I don't know what's going on with you, but I know that I've got a medicine that was an old-fashioned cholesterol drug invented way back in the 1950s and 60s when we thought cholesterol came from eating eggs. He says, I can give that to you to cool, to cool off your inflammation. And she said, sounds like a plan. He said, I mean, no, not inflammation, your diarrhea. And he gave her the cholestyramine to cool off her diarrhea because she says the, the main side effect of cholestyramine is it gets you constipated. And when you're having 20 poops a day, that sounds good. <laughs> uh, she comes in five days later and says, not only is my diarrhea better, but my fatigue is better, my aches and pains are better, my sleep's better, my concentration is better, my brain fog's better, my... She went down the whole list and said, everything's better. And Richie Shoemaker goes, holy Toledo, I haven't a clue what's going on. I've done something, we've solved the mystery illness and I don't know why. And then he gave Cholesteramine to Joe, and Joe got better. And then 150 people in town were sitting in his office saying, I want that mystery, that, that cholesteramine stuff. Well, that might be a slight exaggeration. But very quickly the word spread, and he realized that he had plugged into something interesting. Well, he had a friend from medical school down in North Carolina who was also in the newspaper. He read about a fish kill going on down there. He calls up and he says, you guys got any problems down there? And he found another place where fish kill was where there were mystery symptoms. And sure enough, they got better with cholesterol. So Richie Shoemaker started exploring all the fish kills on the East Coast and finding folks with these symptoms and recognizing that there were all kinds of symptoms going on. And in his books, you could read some of those stories. And this was sort of the beginning of the internet. And when you start publishing that information with these people showing all these symptoms, and what Shoemaker did that was brilliant was he started collecting data on them. And he started saying, okay, this is what's going on with this person, this is what's going on with this person, let's put it together and see if we can start making something out of it. So he started with what you'd call an N of one, and when an N of one becomes an N of 20, and then you start having statistical significance. And of course, if you say in the state of Maryland that our water's polluted and our, uh, we're, poisoning our, we're poisoning our seafood, guess what? how popular you are with the state of Maryland. <laughs> so the local authorities weren't excited. They didn't want to say that there was something wrong with their seafood or something going on. But what was going on was a hysteria epidemic caused by copper 
thunderstorms making a big flush of water and that flushed copper out of local tomato fields where you spray tomatoes every week with copper anti-fungal agents. The copper is a toxin to the fisteria. The fisteria, in response to the toxin, goes into a cyst form and the water actually the water in the river smelled different and looked different, and some people even said their hands burned when they put it in, because there were so many dinoflagellates of Fisteria putting out the toxin. Now, the people living in town aren't living in Fisteria. They're living in a clean environment. So they got better quickly when they got treated. So that, we're going to build on that theme and recognize when we're living in our homes, and our homes are the problem, that's the whole point. Our homes might be the problem. How are we going to figure that out? And certainly this looks like a terrible tragedy, certainly for the fish. Um, but let's go to Milwaukee. Blue-green algae is also a toxin. How many people have paddle boated down in the, at the lagoon? Holly and I are members of the hiking club, and the hiking club loves to hike around the lagoon. I have a client who lives on a condo above this lagoon, and he's so sick he couldn't feel better until he moved out of his condo. Now, is he sensitive to the lagoon? He walks around it every day. That's his activity. So I'm not sure that his condo is so bad, but he was convinced that that's what it was. And he moved out of it. He said, I can't, I can't live there anymore. But look at the blue-green, look at the beautiful color of our own Milwaukee lagoon. Uh, Lyme disease. Uh, last year, shoe, uh, shoemakers turning the Lyme community on its head because Lyme disease puts out a toxin. You can fix and you can prove that you can fix somebody with a very special test called a C3A that says the membrane of the bacteria is no longer there. The bacteria is no longer in you. And yet we keep treating people with antibiotics. And you know, you know that the tetracyclines are pretty potent anti-inflammatory drugs? So if you've got inflammation going on and I keep giving you tetracyclines, I can get you feeling a little bit better and you feel like you're being treated for your, and your Lyme infection. But in fact, the infection may be long gone, but the biotoxin's in you still. Oh, I... Pop quiz. Oops, what happened to my pop quiz? Oh, no. <laughs> You lucky devils, you got out of it. <laughs> I don't know where it went. There were some uh, questions in there that were going to be asked. And I suppose they'd be things like, name two causes, name two causes of biotoxin. Lyme, Lyme disease? Mold. Mold. Okay, I don't expect you to remember Ziguatera and Fisteria, those are weird names. Multiple insect stings might catch your eye. You might remember Cipro. And Another question would be something on the order of, well, let's see. Okay, here's Shoemaker's Biotoxin <laughs> Pathway. And if you Google this on the internet, you can look this up and see it. And I'm going to go through each of these steps as we go through A, treatment, and B, or diagnosis and treatment. But it all starts, oh dear, I have lost my, what's happened is this, I've lost all my, uh, animation. Animation. Mm. That's an interesting problem. Well, I'm, the animations that show step number one right here is you get exposed to a biotoxin. And when you get exposed to a biotoxin, 74% of us, 74% of us get rid of it. Our immune system can see it, can label it, can tag it, and get rid of it. This half the room, cut that in half, okay. Those eight folks over there are trouble. The rest of you guys are maybe not. What happens is, is the biotoxin circulates in your body. Now, in mold, you breathe it in. In mold, you're breathing it in. And when it gets into you, it circulates through your body, and it causes all sorts of receptors in your body to get fired off. And those receptors, I'm going to show you exactly pictures of what they look like. But those receptors, toll like surface proteins, put out signals calling for immune help. 
And so you set off <coughs> markers calling for your immune system to help, and those markers go up to your brain and damage your hypothalamus. Most importantly, they damage what's called the leptin receptor. And the leptin receptor is key to your brain feeling it's had enough food to eat. So leptin is the hormone that says, stop eating, you've had enough. Your fat cells put out leptin and say, ah, stop eating, you've had enough. So you damage your leptin receptor. The unique thing about the leptin receptor, though, is you absolutely have to have it to put out these other hormones called VIP, melanocyte stimulating hormone, and ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Well, antidiuretic hormone is uh, the hormone that you put out when you are dehydrated. You put out antidiuretic hormone so you don't pee. So if you're dehydrated because you're running a marathon, or it's a hot day, and you're mowing the lawn, or you just haven't drunk anything for 12 hours, your blood concentration is getting a little bit higher. So the concentration of ions in your blood is just a little bit higher. So you put out antidiuretic hormone that says, stop making pee, hang on to water, so I can hang on to free water, and just get rid of salt. Okay? In mold illness, that meter is meant to be set like this, and in mold illness, so when, you, when it gets up to here, you put out antidiuretic hormone and you stop peeing. When it gets down to here, after you've drunk 12 beers and you're peeing like a little racehorse, then you pee like everything and water just comes out like water. The problem with mold illness is you're down to here. So your ADH is off, or you're up to here, your ADH is off, it's just off. And so you will pee 20 times a day. And you thought you were getting too old. And you, what's really happening is your blood's really quite concentrated, but you're peeing too much. You're peeing too much for how concentrated your blood is. So your sweat glands, your sweat glands say, I'm going to help out. There's too much salt in the blood, so I'm going to put some salt out into my skin. So then you're going to get extra salt on your skin, which salt on your skin makes your skin act like a battery. You become a conductor. So extra salt on your skin means you take off your sweater and you get close to the light switch and you get an arc of lightning. Mm -hmm. Folks with mold illness will frequently tell you, so if you look on the symptom list, static shocks are on the list. Now, static shocks happen to anybody in January when you're taking off your sweater. Right. Mold illness, say they happen to them all the time and they get used to just going around and turning on the light switches with their elbows. And you'll, I've now, I've now learned to recognize anybody who comes into my office with two, two water containers and leaves halfway through to go pee has a problem. They think they're getting old and their bladders aren't any good. Okay, that's one example. But melanocyte stimulating hormone is by far the most important. And melanocyte stimulating hormone gets deeply suppressed. And melanocyte stimulating hormone it's the hormone that is foundational to many things. It sounds like a trivial name because it was discovered around the hormone that makes you tan, makes your melanocytes tan. Well, that sounds so trivial, it's just ridiculous. Uh, but melanocyte stimulating hormone is foundational to putting out melatonin so you sleep at night. It's foundational to the support of pain so now instead of having adequate pain, you have a minor surgery. You have a surgeon do arthros arthroscopy on your knee. And the surgeon says to you, oh, you'll be back to work next week. You'll be fine. I did. I had both my knees done, and I was back to work on one knee in about, oh, two days. And the other knee, the other knee took me a couple of weeks. But I was, I was back to work. I was, it just hurt for a while. But you have no message. You'll be sick. You'll hurt for six months. So when we talk about the scope of mold illness, take me to pain clinics and look at some pain clinics who have chronic pain, and people look at them and say, oh, you just have a weak constitution, and you're sort of a wuss, and you're drug-seeking. And we're not going to give you narcotics for that. Well, of course, narcotics are going to be the wrong answer. The answer is remove the source of the pain, because your MSH is low, so you have chronic pain. Gastrointestinal problems. Without MSH, 
you lose the ability to protect your gut or your lungs or your nose. The, side, the membranes of your nose, the membrane of your lung, the membrane of your gut, your immune system doesn't have its foundation to protect it. So you get chronic bronchitis or adult onset asthma. Shoemaker contends that probably the vast majority of adult onset asthma, as my example of my ciguatera client, is mold illness. And yet pulmonary doctors treat you with all sorts of steroids and long-standing do, 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 all to no avail. Okay? But also, without MSH, your gut then starts not being able to protect itself from all kinds of foods that are obnoxious and a little bit stressful on your gut, like wheat. So everybody who's going to a gluten-free store because they say I'm gluten sensitive and they say, oh, I can't eat gluten because I'm just too sensitive to it. <clears throat> is it everybody or is it just a large number of them? We don't know. We're too early in that journey. But what I'm finding is if I measure MSH, I'm finding so much low MSH. And so all these folks get sensitive to gluten. And you're going to see step four is going to be removing you from wheat prolonged illness of any kind. So you get sick and you can't get better. You get a cold and that cold lasts you for weeks. Or you get a cold and a perfectly ridiculously normal skin flora called staph epidermidis. In medical school, I remember sitting in medical school and they had all of us take a little petri dish in microbiology and we took a cotton swab and we swabbed our hand and we would put it on the petri dish and the next day, sure enough, you could identify there was staph epidermidis growing. And everybody says that's a completely innocuous bacteria that grows on your skin. That's fine. And you go, huh? And it turns out it's not innocuous. When you have low MSH, staph epidermidis goes up in your nose. And in your nose, it makes a biofilm. And a biofilm is basically a community of gunk. It's fungus, it's bacteria, it's protein, but it's impenetrable to antibiotics. It's impenetrable to antibiotics. And in that biofilm, they're kind of having a big group orgy. All the bacteria connect to each other and share their DNA. This is bacterial orgy. And that makes them multiply antibiotic resistance. So they get all their multiple antibiotic resistance from each other, which means you can't fix it with antibiotics. So how many people have had more than one sinus infection in a year, any given year? <laughs> OK. Am I expanding the scope enough for you to understand that the, how the risk of this gun turns out to be? And so we put you on stronger and stronger and stronger <laughs> antibiotics, saying you need a stronger antibiotic. Or maybe you need an antifungal. And actually, sometimes antifungals work if you try them. But more likely, what's going on is that your immune system, if you have low MSH in your immune system, can't see that infection. And that biofilm, staph epidermidis in your nose, will only go away when you break up that biofilm. But that biofilm puts out two proteins called hemolysins. And you know, your sinuses, the top of your sinuses is this far away from your hypothalamus. The, the nasal tracts that go right up into your hypothalamus from the top of your nose. So whether those hemolysins circulate in your blood or whether they circulate in your nose, we're not certain. Probably in the blood, but we think it could be either. But you continue to have low MSH as long as you have Marcons in your nose. So we'll talk about Marcons more. So Marcon stands for Multiple Antibiotic Resistant Coag Negative Staph. And we'll get to that in the next talk. MSH is critical to cortisol production. Cortisol production is your energy. Right now, you all have nice peak cortisol because it's 8 o'clock in the morning, or 9 in the morning. <coughs> With damaged MSH, you're going to have low cortisol. So I've been spending 50, I've, the last 10 years, I've been telling people, you have adrenal fatigue. You're sort of tired and wiped out, and people come to me and say, my thyroid's no good, and I have adrenal fatigue, and I've got to take all these herbs to repair adrenal fatigue. And I would say probably the majority of people with adrenal fatigue have low ACTH because they have mold illness. And you, if you repair your mold illness, you'll fix the adrenal fatigue. 
Have I left any human beings out yet? Is there anybody who isn't sick? Have I got everybody, everybody feeling like they've been thrown under the bus? So it might not be all of these, but this is so early in the journey of understanding, this is clearly it's going to be a component of all of these. And whether it explains everything is obviously up for future research and development. But as you understand the importance of, co of that, then you also reduce your androgens. So uh, many men with low testosterone, I've now been checked, I've probably checked 50 men now with low testosterone who come to me and say, oh, I, I need, I'm, my energy's low and I need more testosterone. Because there's all these ads on TV yeah, that if, yeah. I can, if I can just get testosterone, I'll walk on water and be a wonder man. You measure their MSH and they're in the cellar. And I just try, I can do one test, I say, I just do one test. And so the scope of it, now I've, now I've included every man who thought he was okay. And so I don't think there's anybody left I've left out. So all those poor people who don't know about it yet don't know how big the scope of, M of mold illness is going to be. But when this, these things happen, you then have a, the cytokine storm going on and folks get 29 odd symptoms or 37 odd symptoms on their list. So, how's that going about? So here I want to show you a picture. On every blood vessel, on every fat cell, on the gut, throughout your gut, your body has what we call toll-like receptors. They are proteins watching to see when gunk comes along of different kinds. They're watching to see when you're being invaded by a foreign invader. So when you have a bacteria that's causing an infection, they're meant to say, okay, here's a protein called flagellum that comes from the little tails. Here's a protein called lipoprotein uh, that's part of the coat of the protein. Here's some of their DNA. Here's some of their whatever. All the different things that are pieces of bacteria that could be foreign invaders, you're meant to have these little toll-like receptors, which you could think of them as barcode readers. Your blood vessels are lined with miniature barcode readers. Oh, okay, I understand that, because we're all used to thinking of phones, and everybody's carrying a little barcode reader in their, on their smartphone <laughs> that you can now read barcodes with. Your body's lined with all these little barcode readers, and those little barcode readers, basically all they can do is call for help. All they can do is call for help. And when they call for help, your body then says, oh, there's somebody's pulled the fire alarm, let's send a team to help out. And that's called your first, that's called your innate immune system. Your innate immune system responds to calls for help. Now, the problem is, oh yeah, see we've lost all the, I've lost all my, I've lost all the animations on this talk. I've lost Because the animations are gone. What percent of people are vulnerable to mold? 24%. Which means in a household where there's two people, that's a 50% chance of somebody being sick in any given household. Okay. Uh, where does the inflammation pathway start? In tiny little receptors, tiny little barcode readers all over your body, white cells, fat cells, blood vessels, what do toll-like receptors or tiny little radars or barcode readers do? They call for help. And you don't feel it necessarily, but they just call for help. Those messengers, all those calls for help, the cytokines that they put out, there's a whole cloud of cytokines. Again, this is some, you probably have 200 inflammatory markers and 200 anti-inflammatory markers. That cloud of those 200, we are just learning how to measure some of them. And they only last for a couple seconds. You make the inflammatory ones from what? Does anybody know this is an extra bonus point? You make the inflammatory ones, they're all built off the skeleton of omega-6 fatty acids which come from vegetable oils. You make the anti-inflammatory ones off the foundation of the chassis of fish oil. Omega-3s. So this is where one choice on diet allows us, so 200 years ago our diet in America had two omega-6s for one omega-3s, but as we've gotten cheaper and cheaper vegetable oils, our intake of omega-6s has gone up, 
And as we've lost grass-raised animals, our omega-3s have gone down. So our ratio of omega-3s to 6s six, to 3s in America has gone from 2 to 1 to 15 to 1, 30 to 1, 50 to 1. If you're a fast food frequenter, it's 50 to 1, which means you're forcing yourself to make inflammatory messengers, messengers. And OK, so we'll keep going here. So anybody flunk this is going to get in big trouble with me because it's an open book. So, so here's what some of the pictures look like. Uh, here's, here's some of the moles. Molt cladisporum, uh, chitonium, aspergillus. You might have never heard these names. Here's penicillium. That's how penicillin gets made. Uh, here's another penicillin. Here's under electron microscopes what they look like. These spores are tiny. So, but wait, it's not the spores. Anybody who comes to your house, if you call a mold remediation person, they come to your house, they put up a little machine saying, we're going to measure the amount of spores. And their argument is going to be, I've got a little machine that can suck the water through here, I suck the air through here for 10 minutes, and I can give you a count of how many spores you've got. I have purchased that machine. It is sitting unused in my office. It does not tell you what's going on. And yes, the argument is that's telling you it's circulating in the air, but that's not what's getting you sick. Research shows that does not correlate with being sick. Okay? The problem is what we're looking for is something that's one thousandth the size of a spore. It's much smaller. And to date, we have not been able to identify what that exact culprit is. Nobody knows what it is. This is, again, a ripe area for research. But we do know when you see a black mold colony on growing on your wall that you can get multiple fungi, bacteria, actinomyces, mycobacteria, inflammagens, endotoxins, beta-glucans, hemolysins, blah, 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 blah. You know, all these complicated things that can make you go crazy. But the takeaway for you is it's not the spore. Simple as that. Now, the toxins of mold are actually quite small. It's not the toxin either, but the toxins are part of it. The toxins from molds are part of it. And it's clear that these are actually quite potent toxins. And these are very small molecules. Any one of these would be a millionth the size of a spore, of just a spore. And a spore is a millionth the size of a mold, what you saw in those pictures. So these are tiny, tiny molecules. So here's the blue-green algae toxin. It's a, a unique molecule. It's a big circle. Uh, aflatoxin. Anybody ever heard of aflatoxin? Sure. What's it from? What's aflatoxin from? Yeah. Well, it's all in moldy <coughs> peanuts. It's probably the number one. It's identified as one of the number one toxins for causing cancer. And you can show that the, the rate of peanut, moldy peanut ingestion highly correlates with rates of in, with cancer. So aflatoxins are very dangerous, very, very dangerous toxin. Yes? Can you identify a product that has aflatoxin in it? I would think not. So even if the peanuts taste good, you don't necessarily know that right. they're not contaminated. You don't know it's contaminated, right. In fact, there's a very famous, the man who wrote the book, The, the China Study, his first job was to go to the Philippines and try to do an exploration of why rich kids were getting an epidemic of cancer in the Philippines. And that's where aflatoxin was discovered. It's a moldy environment. They get a lot of rain. And the wealthier families were eating many more peanuts and more peanut butter. And were getting, so yeah, it was something that's dependent on high-tech research lab testing, and which is why we're meant to regulate, why we're meant to regulate the mold why farmers can't sell their corn unless it's been dry. Why peanut farmers can't sell, you know, you heard about the story about five years ago about the peanut farmer down in Georgia who got shut down because there was all moldy, they weren't being. But you know, what, what major food in America do we not regulate for mold? Europeans regulate it, and in America we do not regulate? Coffee. Coffee. <laughs> right. So back row gets an A. All right. Uh, but it's not the toxin either. They are tiny molecules. They're designed by mold to poison other molds in their neighborhood when they're competing with them. 
So they're sort of there to, you know, I've got a, this is a tough neighborhood out there in the pile of leaves in your backyard, and they're, that's what they're there for. There are hundreds of millions of them per square foot of space. In your house, if I take a square foot of carpet, I can find hundreds of millions of mold toxins per square foot on your carpet. And you'll never clean it up. You can never clean it up because they bind too tightly. But that's not it either. That's not it either. We don't know what it is. That's the problem. All these different things, nobody knows yet, and this is a ripe area for research. We're going to have to go for it. What we do know, you know, this is much better to have lost the animations Can you cut to the chase. So my wonderful <laughs> slide that I put down all these funny things like lectins, dectins, da, 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 it comes down to those are all different kinds of things to which we have that set off immune response. But what the net effect is, our body has a very sophisticated system called pattern recognition. PAMPs and DAMPs. And this is pattern recognition, and this is damage recognition. And we have a pattern recognition system that can figure what's going out, and all these, pack, all these patterns activate pathways. So we have pattern recognition pathways that say there's something much more complex. It's, it's criminal for us to simplify the human immune response to a simple little couple words. It's incredibly sophisticated, nuanced, and complex. But this pattern recognition is the whole activation pathway, but that's the best signal of something going on. Our body has the ability to recognize pattern recognition. And so when you talk about that, what's the distribution of biocontaminates in a water-damaged building? Let's see. The biotoxins are 3%. The viable mold is 2%. The chemicals that are in the air from whatever it is is maybe 15%. And 80% is unknown gunk. And all of it put together makes a pattern. All, but we're, give me 15 more slides and we're going to explain that that's actually very exciting because we're going to figure it out. So don't, don't feel despair. All this is meant to tell you is the guy who comes to your house who says he's going to tell you how much mold he's got and puts out a little machine and charges you $50 for each time he uses a cassette doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay? Because that's what every mold expert in the Milwaukee metro area is doing right now. That's what they've been taught. That was the first iteration that came out about 10 years ago, and that's now out of date. That doesn't work. Uh, pop quiz. It's not the spores of the DNA, then what is it? OK, you better not flunk this one. The PAMPs, the Pattern Recognition Pathway. Pathogen-Associated Molecular Patterns. And DAMPs, Damage-Associated Molecular Patterns. What percentage of damage comes from old spores? Two or three percent. What's the most important, the toxic poison effect or the inflammation effect? Inflammation. All right. So it's the inflammation that's the main problem. SIRS has uncontrolled responses to biosurface pattern in the is the primary problem. The HLA risk, one in four susceptible chronic inflammation as a result. So as we measure your HLA typing, which we'll do in the next talk, I'll, we're going to show you how to do that. When exposed to biosurface PAMPs, we get sick because we can't clear those PAMPs. Our immune system is unable to stop that PAMP set off. There's something about that switch. It's the fire alarm switch. This, we can't turn it off, folks who are vulnerable. And what we can't turn off is something called the complement pathway. And this is your lizard very basic innate immune response. Your immune system has two levels. It has the first response that basically has nonspecific kickboxing response. You attack me, I'll attack you back. The second system is our adaptive system that says, what are you attacking me with? I'm going to make an antibody that's going to attack you back with a precise antibody that only attacks you. Whereas the innate system simply puts out inflammation and anything that's out there is going to get whacked. 
In SIRS, chronic inflammatory response syndrome is the activation of your complement innate immune system. It's called complement. This has nothing to do with you wearing nice jewelry today, or nothing to do with your makeup, or your shoes. This is not a compliment. For whatever, how it got named that, we have no idea, except that it's sort of, maybe it's complementary. But there's three pathways into the complement system, and it's meant to do three things. Opsonization is a fancy term for, put a label on this so a white cell can come and eat it. So this, what you do here is you label that and say, yep, you gotta eat this guy because it's an invader. The label here, lysis, is basically a molecule, plug a molecule into the wall so it spills its guts out. So you put out a chemical, basically a protein, it's a donut, and plug a donut into the wall of that bacteria so it loses all its guts and dies. So it either gets gobbled up, or it loses its guts, or you set off this inflammation pathway that's like a set of dominoes. A set of dominoes that just gets higher and higher and higher and higher. So when you get a bee sting, this is uncontrolled. So folks who have anaphylaxis to a bee sting, that's the uncontrolled response there. Mold is setting that system off, and it's only one of the pathways. It's the lectin detection pathway and activation. That's probably the most active part of that. So we now know it's this complement pathway, and of which three, we set off one of them. That's all you need to take with you. You don't need to take more complicated than that. But the, the, you can actually measure, there's now lots of research on MASP2, which is this secondary pathway that's sort of setting all that stuff off. So when you look at, when you realize the incredible, nuanced, sophisticated immune response we have, that we've evolved over millions of years, that's what's running amok in mold. And it's the one pathway the mannose binding lectin pathway that's being set off. Now what I think is fascinating is mold is coming along and saying we're having all sorts of disruption from this lectin pathway and that's the exact same thing that's happening with lectin containing foods. How many people here have read Stephen Gundry's book The Plant Paradox? <coughs> okay. This should be required reading for everybody in this room. Uh, if you're worried about mold, you need to think about lectins. And lectins, just the 30 second synopsis, lectins are the proteins that plants put out to keep animals from eating them. The most obvious lectin is in green apples. What happens when you eat a green apple in June? You get sick. Apples put out boatloads of lectins so that you don't eat them in June. They want you to eat them in September. They turn ripe, the lectins fade away, now you can eat them, the seeds are ready, and you will then poop out those seeds somewhere else and spread the apple. So the plant wants you to do that. Now, what, does anybody know what uh, food we've taken and genetically modified in the last 70 years and tripled its lectins? Wheat. Wheat. We took wheat with 14 chromosomes and added 14 chromosomes from two grasses. Have you ever seen a human being getting fat eating grass? Are humans designed to eat grass? That's not in our food chain. So we added the lectins of two, so wheat now has a boatload of lectins in it. And Gundry's book is all about those lectins. Uh, and so we, that's a whole other talk all of itself. I just enjoy the synergy of the two and recognizing that's how we're setting off this immune response in mold and Gundry argues you're setting off that same dysfunctional immune response in food. So meanwhile, the Government Accountability Office put out a paper in 2006 saying it's the multiple inflammations that can cause illness will be found in damp buildings, but absolutely specifically the causation does not exist. We cannot name what it is. That was published in 2006. So anybody who says, and this oftentimes comes down to legal things, if you get in a court battle because 20 employees say, I'm so sick with mold, I can't work in this building, so you go to court, and the lawyer says, would you tell me the exact causation of this illness? <coughs> to which the answer is, I can't tell you. It doesn't exist. We don't know yet. Our science is not far enough along. And so this becomes an issue of legal battles when you see that happening. And so 
here's some of the things that our, our innate immune response puts out. For example, the defensins are just a set of proteins that put holes in pathogens. So this is the molecule that gets plugged into the wall of a bacteria and makes that bacteria lose its guts. All right? Now, anybody have a friend die of sepsis? Do you know what sepsis is? It's the number one cause of death in hospitals in America. It's an overwhelming infection, right? We've been hearing in the flu epidemic recently, we've been hearing how people get influenza. What makes this particular flu particularly vicious is it's setting off this cascade of uncontrolled, called a cytokine storm. And so we've heard about all these kids dying from flu. Okay? Sepsis is that cytokine storm going crazy. Well, SIRS is the same process, but slightly in reverse. But they have PAMPs and DAMPs in common. And the key difference is, in SIRS, the T reg cell, well, I'm not going to that. It's sort of opposite sides of the same coin. One is completely uncontrolled, the other just doesn't stop. It's, it's sort of controlled, but it never stops. So SIRS is chronic low-grade <coughs> sepsis. It's the equivalent of chronic <coughs> low-grade sepsis. It's like you've got an infection going on, but you can't find it. Now, if you had a toothache, you could find it. But you've got this chronic, vague triggering of your immune system, and you just feel crummy. Pop quiz. SIRS and sepsis have what in common? Amps and dams. Okay? So that's basically your pattern recognition, your sophisticated pattern. The complement system can do what with SIRS? And I make the joke, the complement system in SIRS, you're meant to say, please calm down. So anybody who's seen Larry Shoes, the play, the foreigner, what we say is, bees calm down. And the foreigner, that's the whole point of the whole play. This crazy man is saying these silly phrases. But that's what's happening in you and SIRS. Your immune system is saying this stupid phrase you don't understand. It's meant to be saying, please calm down. And your complement system can't. You can't stop, can't stop, can't stop, can't stop. So you keep <coughs> making that inflammation keep going. What does opsonization mean? Fancy term for being gobbled up by white cells. The lectin pathway is set off in SIRS is the most common initiating pathway. What are lectins? The poisons plants put out to keep them from being eaten by animals. And so every plant makes them, and your body is used to them to the degree of uh, cooking would get rid of uh, lectins. So who can name me, uh, what's the most common cause of food poisoning in American schools? The most common cause of food poisoning in American schools is the cook not cooking the kidney beans long enough. Kidney beans are loaded with lectins. If you eat four raw kidney beans, I can give you blood clots. If you don't soak kidney beans overnight and boil them for at least four hours, you get sick. So one quarter of food poisoning epidemics in American schools are because the cook missed their bus in the morning, got to work at eight instead of seven, the kidney beans only cooked for four hours instead of six hours, five hours, whatever. But kids ate. Cooking destroys the lectins, but without cooking them long enough, so kidney beans you have all the time right in front of you. You've got them in your house right now. They have potent lectins. You can get very sick if you eat raw kidney beans. But you know very well, because your mother told you, that you have to cook kidney beans. Or you buy them canned and just wash them out, and then they're done. OK. Uh, but here's the future. This is what's totally fascinating. I can't wait for this to happen. Turns out, by analyzing millions of RNA transcripts you can come up with patterns from big data that tell you exactly what's going on in SIRS. <clears throat> and this is going to be coming in about two years. This is going to blow open all of medicine. This is the equivalent of Spock's wand. We're going to have the blood test that's going to tell you how to diagnose almost every disease, which is fascinating. Do you know what percent of your gene, of your DNA, is actual DNA? When I take your chromosomes, do you know what percent of your chromosomes is DNA? 1.5%. You only have 22,000 genes. One half to 2% of your genetic, of your chromosome is protein. So what's the other 95%? <coughs> well, 
some of these are transcription pro proteins, but basically roughly 80% of the human genome consists functional coding sequences for RNA. And those RNA messages go out and tell your cells what to do when. And when you're sick, if we can interpret that RNA stuff, I can say, you got that pattern, and this is mold. And you got that pattern, and this is Lyme disease. And you got that pattern, and this is, oh, you got pneumonia. And you got that pattern, you got congestive heart. You know, anything infectious or related to inflammation is coming soon. This big data test is actually on the market now. It's on the market now, it costs $1,800. So it's just now getting on the market, and we're going to be able to diagnose unbelievable numbers of things as people get trained on how to do it. And so for those folks who have a loose $1,800 and want to just be curious, uh, I will explore with you on how to find it. I don't have loose $1,800. Uh, and so this, this is going to be big data coming, and it's going to help us sort out this, the SIRS experiment. And there's tons, this is the cutting edge of research right now, which I think is terribly exciting. So, conclusion. SIRS is uncontrolled inflammation of the innate immune system caused by an amalgam of many sources of pattern recognition something or others. It's nothing specific, we can't tell you what it is, but it travels with mold. It also travels with blue-green algae, ciguatera, <coughs> Lyme disease, blah, 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 okay? Some folks can have it, but most folks don't. 24%, 76%. Diagnosis will soon be available by pattern recognition of RNA, DNA, and that's coming soon. Good, questions? Any questions for you? Okay, we're, sorry for getting a little straight. Yes? Um, has there been any connection uh, of uh, chronic oral infections to SIRS also? Oh my gosh. Well, I could go on for quite a while. Is there Shoemakers any? found that almost everybody who has uh, uh, root canals has Marcon's in it. Oh. Yeah. And oh. so Marcon's gets in your nose and gets in your whole face. So people who have multiple tooth uh, infections are probably. Uh, have Marcons, and so cleaning up Marcons might prevent to future, might prevent future root canals. And so you hear about people who have 10, 12, 14 root canals, and you go, oh my gosh. And the only thing it fixes oh, is that you got to take out the inflammatory tissue and put in a, an implant. In my next life, I'm going to be an implant dental surgeon because then I'll, you know, make a hundred million dollars a year. You know, because <laughs> I mean, those guys are, are just printing money because there's so many people with damaged faces. Next, any other questions? Okay, we did the, uh, yeah? Um, you mentioned green apples. Were you, did you really mean green apples, or you meant like not ripe apples? No, no, not ripe apples. Not ripe. Okay. No, no, you're allowed to have, you're allowed to have, uh, you know. There's a couple species that are green that you make in pies. They're ripe. If they pick them, they're ripe. But, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Gundry makes a big point saying you can't eat fruit unless you pick it ripe in season. Because any fruit that's picked when it's unripe and then stored for months to be stored later time of the year is going to be filled with lectins. Wow. And so, you know, it's a nice idea. You can kind of genetically do it. But so right now, don't buy apples. Don't buy apples in February. Sorry. Yes? What is Gundry's book's name again? Uh, Gundry's book is called The Plant Paradox. <coughs> and uh, it's my belief that the plant paradox is going to be the fundamental driver of all autoimmune disease. If you follow uh, Gundry's paradigm precisely, and that includes you may not eat any animal raised on corn and beans. Because corn and beans are very, very rich lectin-containing foods. Cows are meant to eat grass. That's what they were designed for. They're nice and lean animals when they eat grass, but we feed them corn and beans and make them fat, and we also give them boatloads of lectins when we do that. And their meat contains boatloads of lectins. And as a consequence, if you have an autoimmune disease and you eat, and you eat feedlot-raised animal, you are getting the lectins from the animal, which means you are not only you not only are what you eat, you are what the, what you eat eats. Get that? 
So if anybody needs some grass-raised animals in my yard, I have six deer that walk through every night. <laughs> and I would be happily to look the other way if you come and get rid of a few of them. <laughs> Wouldn't we all? Wouldn't we all? Right, exactly. Yes? Wouldn't that uh, cooking take care of that? No. Uh, with the apples and make apple pie or a small segue, if you do, I, okay, I'll just do a little segue on lectins for Gundry's issues. Uh, cooking does take care of it to a pretty good degree. So good cooking, and that's, humans learned to cook about 150,000 years ago, which allowed our brains to keep getting bigger and expand our repertoire of what we could eat, and all was going well until we got to the 21st century. And in the last 100 years, we've added a whole bunch of of uh, chemicals to our environment that damage our gut and allow us to absorb lectins even more. And now we've seen an explosion of autoimmune diseases. And those chemicals that we've added to our environment are called non-steroidal, ibuprofen, Aleve, and all those, meloxicam and all those, uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, prednisone, uh, PPIs, non-steroidals, all those foods. They make your gut more leaky so then you absorb more lectin so that you set off your tiny little receptors so you and so where, where Gundry is right now is he's running a clinic where he can't get enough he doesn't have enough space to take care of all the autoimmune patients he's seeing and so the American Academy of Functional Medicine is now putting together their first autoimmune course of which Gundry is the featured speaker as actually a couple other are and the whole topic is how to get rid of autoimmune diseases but you've got to turn off this lectin pathway which is setting up the same inflammation that mold is setting up. And many people will tell you, when they eat wheat, they don't feel good. Right. And the, you go to primary internal medicine doctor, and the doctor says, you're not, you don't have celiac disease, but we haven't learned how to measure the inflammation of lectins. But when the pattern recognition software gets out here with RNA, we'll be able to say, you're incredibly lectin sensitive. It's causing you trouble left and right. And Gundry measures some obscure things like VEGF, <coughs> which actually we're going to get to VEGF in the next talk. Uh. Diagnosing chronic inflammatory response syndrome. <coughs> actually, we're going to do two talks now. T number one is diagnosing, number two is treating. And it's repeating the same information twice, one from how do I figure it out, and so there's a lot of overlap, but that way you learn. By hearing it twice, you'll learn it. And so, as again, you're going to hear some of the basic signs come back, and we'll just simply go into that. And I'm just going to say, where do you start? And I say, people come to me and they say, I've been to five doctors and they all say I sound wacko. And everyone runs for me and they give me antidepressants. And because I have lots of symptoms that change all the time and aren't consistent. And my, if, if I hear this, I used to go, oh no, one of those. And now my ears go up and I go, oh boy, one of those. Because I now know how to help. I said, oh my gosh, this is fascinating. We're going to help you. You're going to be so glad you came to see me. So pay attention. That person has SIRS. Step number one, when you hear those symptoms, their first response should be, where were you exposed and what were you exposed to? The literature says fungal fragments from this size, microns, are shed from fungal colonies known to contain antigens. Fine particulates shed from all sorts of things. Uh, the fragments are readily deposited in the nasal cavity. Uh, pollution studies show that particulate matter in your nose gets into your brain. This has been published. For example, uh, mycotoxins have been detected in the sera of occupants opposed, uh, exposed to the, all this published literature. And they're tiny. Look at the size of these molecules. Botulism toxin weighs 150,000. Many of these mold toxins are down this side. They're tiny little molecules. A Dalton is the equivalent of one proton or one neutron. So carbon, you know, carbon has, you know, what is it, 12 Daltons. Uh, but these sources, where they come from, here's the source of where they come from. Uh, here's blue-green algae. That's the size of the toxin from blue-green algae, 994 toxins. And in experimental models, you can show that stuff gets from your nose right up into your brain. And in fact, there were studies done in Mexico City showing that people who live next to big, big highways with 
uh, big buses, diesel-driven buses going by, their children will have many, many more par particulates in their, in their brain from living close to the highway. You go, oh dear. Uh, and so you can see that, you know, this was published in 2016. One million particles per gram of brain tissue, 200 nanoite in size. So stuff, you can get tiny, tiny things into your brain just from breathing stuff in your brain. And the most of us can tolerate it. 75% of us have the ability to see the biotoxins of whatever biotoxins are, our immune system is competent and able to measure it. And we can tag it and clean it up and those folks don't get sick. And so if I do a randomized placebo-controlled trial of the whole population, and I'm looking at baloney-type diagnoses, 75% of people are normal, so the 25% are all going to just basically be a little bit of noise, <laughs> unless you do a massive study. So you have to say, I've got to take my population and select the population, and then do a randomized placebo-controlled trial. And the argument I make is there's some things that are simply obvious. Nobody has ever done a randomized placebo-controlled trial on parachutes. <laughs> right? Now, whether this shaped parachute or that shaped parachute works, give me 100 people here and 100 people there, we can work on that. But I've yet to find 100 volunteers to say, okay, I'll do without a parachute. You know, we just haven't done that yet. Uh, but there's now all sorts of published literature that's looking at indoor mold as being the problem and their conclusion is it isn't a problem. There's, so I put this in here to say there's all sorts of controversy about this topic. There are people who say no, no, it's because there's all sorts of economic interests and all sorts of other things and so you're never quite sure. So you sort of have to say this was back in 2003, all right, you're getting out of date. Don't quote this article to me, that's too far back. Don't play that. It is a problem. 25% of folks who don't get the genes to recognize mold are frequently, are moderately sensitive. But 2% are disastrously sensitive. And how do you tell if you're sensitive? You can do HLA testing. HLA testing is genotype testing for when you have a failing kidney. You say to your brother or sister, hey, bro, can I have your kidney? Will you share one with me? And each of you has a 25% chance of being a perfect match with one of your siblings, which is why transplants, that's why you hear people going to get a match with a sibling. So when you're doing a heart transplant or, on the other hand, any one of you compared to any other one of you compared to me has one in 20 million. You know, it's quite rare. So we don't, most of the time, don't have perfect matches in transplants. We have partial matches of a couple of the antigens. Well, if I do that kind of testing on you, I can show there are patterns that are disasters. And so I'm going to show you how to read those patterns. We're going to get that in just a minute. So tier one, as you make a diagnosis, there's some tiers of things you make diagnosis. Tier one is, was the person exposed to a toxin somewhere? Mold, lime, tropical fish, fish kill, blue green algae, multiple insect stings, too. Two, could they really have a real disease? Is there, I mean, you have to think about it. Don't get, just because you're into mold doesn't mean everything's mold. Could, that person really could have asthma. They really could have sinus trouble. They really could have a lousy tooth. They really could have whatever. Uh, but all of these diseases might be on the pathway for mold. If that person had Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or well, some people really are a little bit on the anxious side and have other issues, maybe. But run the 37 symptom list. It turns out, if you look at these eight organs, <coughs> general fatigue, muscle troubles, general symptoms, eyes, if you look at those eight symptoms, if you have things from five of those eight symptoms, that's enough to diagnose. If you take all of them, and you have the list in front of you, if you take all of them, now when I say somebody comes into your office and say, I have static shocks all the time, you're going to go, or if they come in and they've got two containers of water, you're going to go, or after talking to you five minutes, they say, do you mind if I go to the restroom? You're going to be, 
Whereas before you came here this morning, you would have said that person was right. Suddenly the light's been turned on. You recognize these symptoms have physiology to them. The problem is the most common symptom is fatigue. Do you know any 55-year-old person who doesn't say I'm tired? <laughs> okay. I mean, everybody's tired. In our lifestyle, what do we need, and all the stuff we do. Okay. Pop, look, now you're going to get stressed out here. Electric shocks happen more often with serves. True. See, you become nice people. Knife-like pain can be part of serves. True. I have a guy coming to me from up north who has been seeing a doctor for two years. He's frantic because he's got sharp knives jabbing him in his armpits. The normal response to that would be to say, wow, I don't know what to do with that. He's had every MRI, every CT scan. He's had his, his, his mold pattern are just off the charts positive. Off the charts positive. Uh, what percent of people are particularly vulnerable to getting sick with serves? Particularly vulnerable? Two percent. It's just two. Well, 24 percent, but I'm, well, I guess I, no, you had that right. I think I got it wrong. Eating a fresh field fish meal in Antigua might give you, what? This is a bonus if you remember this name. Ciguatera, okay? Poisoning from reef fish, eating dinoflagellates. Okay. So here's one of the screening tests called visual contra if you've got mold toxin in your body, one of the things that gets damaged is the ability of your brain to see, to do contrast. So the nerve cells in your eyes can't see contrast. And if I show you this circle, and I say, are the, are the lines there up and down or left and right? And you'd say, those are up and down. And what are these? You'd say, those are leaning a little bit to the right. And those are to the right. And that's up and down, and that's to the left, and that's that, that, that. Do you get the gist? As it gets lighter and lighter and lighter, there comes a point where you can't see it. And what turns out that actually, it's a very sensitive test for folks having mole symptoms, which you can do by just looking at a little set of circles for five minutes. In five to 10 minutes, you can go on the website, survivingmold.com, and for 15 bucks, you can you pay him 15 bucks, it supports his research. Please do it there. And that way, then he'll keep a table, because then you can do it again and again and again and see how you're getting better. But you can show you've got the toxin out of you when your VCS test goes back to normal. And this has been a widely studied, well-confirmed, documented, uh, certified test. And you can show that as you get better, you come back up to normal. But you lose a couple places when you're inflamed, and you get better when you come back to normal. Isn't that interesting? Just a simple screening test. Name of the test again? It's called the Visual Contrast Sensitivity. So if you go to the website, survivingmold.com, it's Visual con so it's VCS. It says, take our VCS test online. Uh, please put my name on it, because I'll, I'll just get a copy and be sympathetic, <laughs> and at least I see it, then you can, we can bellyache together. Uh, but you can, then you can keep a series, because then it's so, and he actually asks you for your symptoms. And when your symptoms add up and your VCS is positive, he'll give you an answer right away. Yep, you're vulnerable. You can see right off the bat, no blood test, very little expense, 15 bucks. You can do a survey to see how sensitive you are. And that's all it takes. And one more time, we're going to get back to this, and then I'm going to this time, uh, oh yeah, here we go. So two, get and interpret the HLA test. Get and interpret find out if this person really is sensitive. And it turns out tissue typing is what your immune system sees. And it's like you've got a couple proteins on your immune system that say, this is you. This identifies you. And when an antigen comes along, you put the antigen next to those proteins, and you present that antigen to your, your the next step in your immune process. and the U cells are all there saying, yep, this is you, and so don't attack this, but you're meant to attack this. And what seems to happen in us is that one of those is broken. So along comes you, and it doesn't work. It just doesn't fit. You can't see it. Your immune system can't see it. So there's incompetent groupings, and you can measure those incompetent groupings. 74, 6% of folks are savvy, 
but the others are unsavvy. 24% are quite susceptible, and 2% are catastrophically susceptible. All right? So you can go to all sorts of places. One place is myhousemakesmesick.com. <coughs> if you want to do this, this is, they've got an interpreter of the immune testing. And on that immune testing, you can get the test from LabCorp. It's test 167120. And I'm right now exploring to say, can I get this from Life Extension? Because Life Extension takes LabCorp tests and puts them down, cuts the price in half. So this is the test number. It's a $600 test when I order it. So that's a little on the pricey side. But LabCorp, if you, Life Extension will allow you, there are six LabCorp draw stations in Milwaukee, and you can go to one of those draw stations and get the test. You don't need a doctor's appointment for it. You don't need a doctor's prescription for it. You just need $600. <laughs> because a doctor's prescription is only there to have your insurance pay for it. So if you have a, if you look on the Life Extension website and say, can I get this test from Life, and LabCorp's Life Extension's backup, Life Extension has a contract with LabCorp, say, we'll get it for roughly half price. So I have, I'm just exploring that now, trying to figure out, because I'm finding so many people's insurance is not working. In, including our own family. So the test number from LabCorp is 167120. And you can cut and paste those numbers, and you can match up the results on myhousemakesmesick.com HLA calc. And when you put the numbers in, it'll tell you. And what you get is this, it, it looks like this kind of gobbledygook, which is why you have to go to myhousemakesmesick.com and plug in the numbers. And when you do that, Here's the DRB1, and you take the number one and put it in there, and the other DRB1 you put in there. And then the DQ, you put in here, and the D, DRB3 and 4, two, 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 and you just put the numbers that come off the lab core test. You plug it into their table, and you get patterns. And if you have an 11352B, you're a disaster. That means you're one of the exquisitely sensitive people. And time after time after time, I'm seeing people come in with these four patterns. And they've self-selected themselves. That's because they've been to 20 doctors. They've got goofy symptoms. They don't feel good. Now mold, these are the ones that are more sensitive to mold. These are the sensitive to chronic Lyme disease. This is Ciguatera. Here's Marcon's. And there's some people who just have low MSH all the time. That's chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. Okay, 11352B, something like 90% of chronic fatigue syndrome is all, are, fits somewhere in here. So the disease called chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia are no longer mystery diseases. We now know exactly, what, that's just the name the House of Medicine has put on them because we're clueless. To date, we haven't had a tool to investigate it. The HLA test gives you strong confirmation. You might look awfully good in normal, in fact, what I'm stunned by is how many people look robust and healthy, and then they just feel awful. You say, you look good to me. You know, so the House of Medicine says, you look gorgeous. I don't feel gorgeous. I don't feel good. Okay, back to this biotoxin pathway now. As we go down the pathway, once I measure that, then I can start measuring the next step. So excessive cytokine levels can't change, change the leptin receptor. I can measure these proteins. So what would happen if I, I can measure MMP9? Because MMP9 measures all the sum of cytokines. So we have this test called MMP9 that measures all the sum of cytokines. You should have an MMP9 between 85 and 332 if you're healthy. And everybody with mold comes in and they tell me, oops, uh, their level was 875, 902, 1,400. And I go, oh my gosh, there it is. And MMP9 is a weird chemical. It basically allows your body to dissolve the basement membrane of blood vessels so that white cells coming in can dissolve and get in. But anybody who has chronic asthma has high MMP9. Anybody who's got any kind of these chronic symptoms. I'm finding high MMP9 in everybody. But it basically increases the permeability of the blood-brain barrier. 
Well, if you're worried about cognitive decline, you're worried about your brain not working well, you don't want to have a low MMP9. Anybody with any autoimmune disease is going to have a high MMP9. And you go, oh my gosh. So turning off all of these things requires paying attention to it. And this is basically a picture of what MMP9 allows cells to come in and get into the tissue. And so there's all these MMP9 chemicals you put out that allow your white cells to come in and invade into the tissue because your white cells are trying to look for a white cell. They're trying to look for an invading bacteria. They got the message, you've got something invading. And they're coming to find, where is that invasion? And the white cells have to be able to get through the membrane to get into the tissue to find it. And there wasn't anything there. You know, they turned on the lights and nobody was there. So MMP9 is allowing white cells to invade into your tissue. Okay. Pop quiz. Oh, isn't this fun? I can put you on the spot now. Okay. <laughs> What cytokine dissolves tissue and lets more cytokines get in? MMP9. Okay. Can you name the process of identifying your risk for SIRS? Can you name the process of identifying your risk? That's haplotyping or HLA tissue type. Okay. Haplotyping is the term, the medical term. But basically, and you can go get it on your own. 600 bucks, you can do it on your own. What happens to your eyes with biotoxin damage to nerves? You lose the ability to see contrast. What happens to your VCS test when biotoxin is cleared out of you? It gets better. Kind of cool. You can actually prove it gets better. So back to the biotoxin pathway. MMP9 is damaged, then you damage these ones. And I can measure them. So let's measure them. MSH falls. Melanocyte stimulating hormone. Normal is meant to be above 35. Everybody is 18, 16, less than 8, 12. And then every now and then I've had a spouse come in and say, you know, my spouse is sick. Could you just measure my test too? And I said, well, you know, it might be $1,500 of lab. And I've had a few people say, I don't care. I want to know. Is it applied to both of us? <coughs> and so I've measured a couple people who don't have symptoms. They feel normal. And you know what their MSH comes back? Hmm. 45. So I'm such a sunny little bunny, I'm not afraid to measure mine because I'm afraid if I come back 45, I'll have a mad spouse. So, <laughs> but my, mine must be normal because I don't have any of those symptoms. But MS, again, melanocyte stimulating hormone controls endorphins, your whole pain system. It controls gut permeability and food allergies. It controls inflammation pathways and innate system. It regulates the Martron's invasion of your nose. It regulates food intake by appetite and leptin. It regulates hormone, estrogen, ACTH, melatonin. So you don't sleep at night. You don't have energy. Your hormones are all too low. It's it uh, defense against invading. MSH is foundational to many of your brain stem's core functions of protecting you. So MSH is low. Who cares if you can't tan? That's not the problem. So melanocyte stimulating hormone runs a lot of these central things. So you measure that, that's on the list. There's melanocyte stimulating hormone, and here's all of its effects. And if you want to read this in detail, you can go back afterwards and Google Shoemaker's Biotoxin Pathway. And it pops up many, many images of it, okay? So let's just look, for example, down here at changes in ACTH levels. If I measure your ACTH, folks will tell you, I'm so tired. So when you wake up at morning, what happens? What's the hormone that makes you feel like waking up when you only have to wake up for your alarm clock? That's cortisol. At 2 o'clock in the morning, your cortisol is 2. And at ten o'clock or 8 o'clock in the morning, it's meant to be 16. So 8-fold, 10-fold rise. But what makes cortisol rise is ACTH. And what makes ACTH function normally is melanocyte stimulating hormone. So if your cortisol, if your cortisol only goes up to eight, 
at 8 o'clock in the morning. I've been calling you adrenal fatigue for the last eight years. Oops. Suddenly the lights turn on and you go, oh, this is much more complicated. I can't tell you how many people come to me and say, something's wrong with my thyroid and I've been to another doctor and they said I have adrenal fatigue and I'm on these eight supplements and they bring out a bag, a plastic bag and they have all these supplements and they're exactly the things I was giving just last year and my ears burn and I go, yeah, yeah, I've been part of the same scam. Uh, I think we're looking down the wrong, we're, 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 we're breathing the wrong air, we're looking down the wrong tube. There's a much more, we've gotten back, we've now learned, we have to go upstream to the source. Let's go upstream to the real source here. There probably are some people who have adrenal fatigue. Clearly, the phenomenon of, of uh, burnout or post-traumatic syndrome, stress syndrome, is real. And I think clearly chronic fatigue plays a part in that. But how come some people can go through the army and come out and not be damaged? And how, how come some people go in and get horribly damaged? Who is it? Are the folks who are being having chronic, chronic, chronic mental health problems are they all folks who have damaged immune systems? Do you see the scope? The scope for this can get bigger and bigger. But if I had somebody in my family who said, I'd say, we should have to investigate that because you aren't going to feel better because you're going to have chronic pain and chronic fatigue and horrible sleep. And we're going to say, oh no, you have post-traumatic stress syndrome. Well, that may be real, but I'm making it worse by you're not having the immune function to move on to it. So if I measure your ACTH, 50% of folks with OMSH have it. So it's part of that picture. And you can sort of get ranges. For example, it can be relative. If your ACTH is below 10, when your cortisol is below 7, that's too low. Or if your ACTH is greater than 15 when cortisol is above 16, that's too high. If you have, an AC, if you have cortisol over 16, you should have a low ACTH by then. And so you get, again, you get this regulation where you're either down here or you're up here. You're down here or you're up here. Now what's interesting, what we're beginning to recognize is why this, all this goofiness happens. Oh, here's your cortisol cycle. Every day your cortisol bursts at 6 o'clock in the morning and then during the day it drops off. And then it bursts at 6 o'clock in the morning. So this is the phenomenon behind jet lag. So when you travel to Europe or to Hawaii, you get all out of, all of, you know, all out of sync. I'm going to India in three weeks. I'm going to be really hopelessly messed up. Uh, but here's what's happening. Your hypothalamus has one giant protein called pro-opio-melanocortin. It's this big a protein. And you have three chopping proteins, or maybe up to six chopping proteins, that cut it in different places. But if you cut it here, you can't get it. You, if you make this piece, you can't make this piece. You know, depending on which chopping protein you turn on, they all kind of overlap. Now, you've seen the effect of this in your life. When you exercise intensely, your body needs more energy, so you put out more what? Cortisol. So if you put out more cortisol, you put out more ACTH. And if you put out more ACTH, this piece is left over, beta endorphin. So what happens when you exercise? You get beta endorphin. You feel good. So once we get you exercising enough, if we can get plug into your beta endorphin effect, we can get you motivated to exercise more. But once you exercise too much, then you get wacko and you won't stop exercising. <laughs> All right, that's, that's because you love that beta endorphin effect, because it feels so good. And I'm not sure there's any such thing as too much exercise, it just feels good. Okay, but that makes sense. Once you understand mold down-regulates this whole picture, the inflammatory process of mold down-regulates the whole picture. Now, what I'm waiting to find out is CBD oil upregulates the whole picture. You know all those people who take CBD oil for chronic pain and feel better? You hear about all these people taking CBD oil and their pain gets better? So CBD oil, I, I'm not sure I understand it correctly and fully, but I think that's where it upregulates it. So here's your ACTH, and here's your MSH, and here's your 
and those all work together. So if you look at the biotoxin pathway, you can measure those things in that biotoxin pathway, and then you can look at reduced ADH. So I can measure your antidiuretic hormone. You tell me you're peeing 20 times a day, and I can say, huh, I can measure your serum osmolality. Osmolality is basically how, what's the concentration of ions in your blood. And I've now probably measured 50 people, and son of a gun, their osmolality would be 290, close to the top, which means their ADH would be high, and their ADH is super low. So here they're, here they're not putting out enough ADH for as concentrated as their blood is. And they're sitting there with two water bottles. And they say, well, I drink a lot of water because my doctor told me it was good for me. Well, how many times a day do you pee? Well, 15. <laughs> I only pee four times. I don't know. Five times? No, I'm saying to be an old guy, so I have to pee more often sometimes. But 15 times a day just isn't normal. And every single one of those people says, I drink a lot because it's good for me. And they don't, haven't recognized, and they just thought they've gotten used to it, and their bladders are getting old and kind of flaky. And, but that's so easy to fix, and we're going to get to the easy fixing stage next. But this hormone called antidiuretic hormone measures your concentration, and it tells you to reabsorb all that water. And so what do your sweat glands do in try to helping out when your salt level's too high? What do your sweat glands do? Your sweat glands put some salt out in your skin. So that's all part of that process, which turns you into a walking human battery. You can be a little ever-ready bunny all by yourself, you know. Pop quiz. MSH was discovered around what feature? What was the reason it was discovered? It's in the name. It makes you tan. Melanocyte stimulating. The, the cells in your skin that make you nice and tan in summer. Okay. What else does MSH control? Everything. Just call out everything. Sleep, pain, energy, sex drive, appetite, immune function, everything. MSH is so central to the whole picture. All right? If someone pees 20 times a day, you should check their bladder function first. Well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but also you should think of SIRS. You know, there may be a bladder function problem. They may be getting old. That might be all true. But SIRS, <laughs> what does ADH do? Antidiuretic does what? <coughs> Antidiuresis. Anti it tells your kidneys to stop losing water. So more of it makes you concentrate urine when you are dehydrated. All right. So if you add these things up, if you have eight or more of the 13 <coughs> symptom clusters, 98% specificity for more, for serve. If you have three of the following, a VCS test, shoulder muscle weakness, and symptoms, 97%. If you have five abnormal labs, 97%. Five of the abnormal lab tests. <coughs> So you can sort of say, somebody comes in and says, I've got 15 symptoms. Well, that's all you need. 13 plus, you're done. You come in and say, I've got 13 symptoms. I don't need to get that, because I don't need to get that word. So do I need to have, make you wait a month before we start doing something? So how many symptoms off the list are needed to diagnose? Uh, or how many clusters of symptoms? Eight. Or what other pattern? Weak muscles, VCS positive, 13 <coughs> symptoms. Or how many labs? I only need five off that list of the 10 different positive tests. So here's another picture of the biotoxin pathway in going through the tests. And if I keep going through, I'm going to see Marcon's. All right, so what's Marcon's? What is Marcon's? 
And where does it come from? Where did it start? But where did it start before you got mold? On your skin, everywhere. There's a couple hundred million of them growing on you right now. Only 2% of normal people, if you have normal MSH, you only have 2% likelihood of being in your nose. It makes a biofilm or slime and sends hemolysins into you, causing persistent deactivation. How do you measure for Marcon's? I just have to do a special swab. So I've, I've tried to get Aurora Healthcare in Milwaukee to do it, and I, think, I might give them a second try because they say they're geared up for it now. You have to keep the bacteria being held for seven days because it's slow growing. And most labs will throw it out after three days. So you, it takes about 10 days to get the answer. But you basically take a cotton swab up into somebody's nose, just enough to make them mad at you. You know, which is why spouses can't do it to their, you know, you have to. So. But Marcon's, you just swap in the nose and send it off, and son of a gun, it's exactly right. Everybody has it. Everybody has it. Now, what we've been, what well, we're going to get how to treat it later. Okay. So how does the Marcon's damage your immune system? It puts out basically these two hemolysins. It puts out these two hemolysins that continue to lower MSH. So once you have, I say you have two merry-go-rounds. Merry-go-round number one is you breathe in the biotoxin, it goes in, it gives your brainstem damage, and then you, your liver says, let's take that toxin, that PAMP or whatever it is, and put it into your gut, into your bile. But your colon, because your colon has your immune system around it, but your immune system can't see it, Whatever those gunky things are, you reabsorb them. And so it goes back up, gives your brain a whack, comes down to your liver, puts, gets into your bile, goes into your colon, comes back up, colon reabsorbs it, comes back up into your brain, gives your brain a whack, goes back down into your liver, and this immune system goes on forever. And if you don't believe it's forever, talk to my man who had bronchitis for those four years and didn't get better until he got treated. It goes on forever, even though he was living in a safe environment. So the biotoxins can circulate endlessly, and your body never digests them. OK, that's merry ground number one. Merry ground number two is Marcon's in your nose gets up there because you have low MSH. But once you have low MSH in your nose, it puts out two proteins that keep the MSH low. So you continue to have low MSH. So that merry ground is going going. And so that continues to damage you. So resistant coag negative staph, Marcon's invades, and you've got an endless, OK. Ermi. Who here has done an Ermi test on their home? Oh, good. See, there's about a third of you. What did you test? What did you test on the Ermi test? Where did you find it? Oh, you have to ask me. <laughs> oh, OK. An Ermi test is an environmental relative mold index. What you're looking for is not the spores. You're looking for the tiny pieces of protein and DNA. Now, you can't duplicate protein and measure one protein molecule, but you can duplicate DNA molecules. So with, there's an enzyme called polymerase PCR, polymerase chain reaction, that duplicates DNA. So if I have one little tiny piece of DNA <coughs> and I expose it to polymerase PCR, I can make I can make a million copies of it. And when I make a million copies of it, I can then measure it and identify it. So what the mold folks do is they want to take pieces of broken DNA in your house, otherwise known as dust bunnies. Does anybody here have a house with no dust bunnies? <laughs> then you have not pulled out your stove. <laughs> or you have not looked under your dryer. Or you have not wiped your fan blades. In my house, we have a standalone closet, and you wipe along the top of the closet. It's been there for 20 years. <laughs> or the fan blades in our living room, or wherever. There's places where you can get dust bunnies, and you, what you get sent is the company. Oh, here we go. The company that does it is called Mycometrics.com. Mycometrics.com. You can go to Mycometrics.com 
www.mycometrics, and you just say, I know what I want to order, and I'm going to order a, uh, an ERMI test. And, I'll, and then they'll send you basically a Swiffer cloth. You just get a little cloth, and you go on to your desk, you know, the, the Holly won't let me climb ladders anymore, so I have to find ways to not. <laughs> I broke my foot last year about this time, so I'm climbing a ladder. Uh, so I would have, you know, wherever the, you just want to get the cloth nice and gray, and you send it back to the company, and for a total cost, they charge you 50 bucks to get the kit, and then another 290 to get the answer, or another 240 to get the answer. So it's a total of 290. And when you do that, they will send you back a score because they can multiply it multiple, multiple times. That little tiny piece of DNA, they can multiply. And then they can say, this DNA comes from this mole. And this DNA comes from that mole. And they'll give you a score, you know, 36 copies after 36 cycles, you have 68 billion copies. So you can make, you know, PCR technology is very powerful. And you get a score. And the ERMI score looks like this. And this is the range of what you see from positive 20 to negative 10. If you have a house that's below 2, if you have a house below 2, you have a safe house. And what they've done is they've taken 40 mole species, they've taken 25 mole species from indoor mole versus outdoor mole. And they assume that when you open the windows in the day, you open the house door, that air comes into your house from various sources, and some outdoor mold is always coming in at a regular steady rate. And so the outdoor mold that's sort of standard for all of us is then comparable to what your indoor mold is. And so they give you a relative mold index. And this is now evidence-based. This is what correlates with people getting better. The Hermes test is really looking at the safety of your home. And you look at these numbers and all these different mold numbers here, and you add them up, and then if your score is, so here's a house that's got a score of four. Not bad, but not safe. Okay? I have a, one of my clients uh, decided to be uh, a hermit and bought a 15-acre plot of land in the woods up north, and he lived there for a month before he took to his bed. And has been in his bed off and on basically for about the last 10 years. And has been seen every doctor in Wisconsin. And his ERMI score was 20. And he, he says, well, when I moved in there, the guy said, do you want me to bulldoze the shack? He says, oh, no, I'll update it and I'll rehab it. The 120-year-old building it was badly mold damaged. And it was sort of sentimental and pretty, but he didn't make the connection between moving in and getting sick. And the guy's been sick for 10 years. And he's now figuring out, I said, you just need to, as our daughter says about our house, you need to bulldoze that house. I don't know if you can fix it. Uh, and then there's the hurts me test. And you guys all might have a hurts me in front of you. Well, what the hurts me test, the, country, the company micro, uh, Micrometrics will charge you for doing it, but you can do your own hurts me test. And hurts me stands for health effects roster of type specific formers of mycotoxins and inflammagen. It's easy to say, it hurts me. It hurts me. You know? And what you do is you get 10 points for each of these. You look at these five moles. These are the most dangerous ones. And if you have an aspergillus over 500, you get 10 points. If you have a wallemia sebi over 2,500, you get 10 points. You get six points for the same five. If they're over these ranges, you get four points for these five if they're over these ranges. And it takes you about two minutes to go through your ERMI score from micrometrics, and you can come up with a Hertz me score. And one more time, if you have a Hertz me score over 10, you can't live there. So for example, here's a place where you have aspergillus penicillitis, and they were over 73, so there's 10 points right there. Mm -hmm. And they have more wallemia. They have, they have 10 points of wallemia, oopsie daisy. So here's a house that has a Hertz me score over 20. They only have two different moles. Wallemia tends to grow in air conditioning units. And particularly air conditioning units that are like tubes that have corrugations in them. Because air conditioning is cool, and so stuff 
condenses and you get water droplets that turn out to be perfect places for mold mm. and then in the summer you can circulate all that wallemia through your whole house. Okay? Uh, and so you can basically add these up. No, they don't get a score there. This one didn't get a score there. This one, uh, well there we go. That one, uh oh, there's a score. You can add those up and come up with your Hertz me score. So anybody who has a score over 15 is too dangerous to live there again. Somebody, if you've been sick before and it hurts me scoring your house, you can't go back in. 11 to 15 is borderline, under 11 has a recurrence rate of under 2%. So if you can get your house down to a hurts me score under 10, that's a safe house. <coughs> so an ERMI score under 2, a hurts me score under 10, your house can be safe. Pop quiz, what is Marcon's? <coughs> your normal skin bacteria invading your nose. What is ERMI testing? <coughs> Relative indoor mold index, inflammagens, DNA fragments. The Hertz me score is safe to move back in. What score of Hertz me is safe to move back in? Under 10. Under 10. Uh, what does PCR technology do? <coughs> Multiplies mold a thousand times, a million times, a billion times. Okay. Finally, you can measure various inflammagens that are basically your your response to fatigue like TGF beta 1. TGF beta 1 is meant to be below 2380. <coughs> it's probably not too dangerous as long as you're under 5000, but once you're under 5000 everybody's sick. And you can you can measure other kind of arcane cells, but basically if that's under 2380, that person's probably in a clean house. So I've seen many people come in with low MSH but their TGF beta 1 is also low. So this isn't dangerous. So they're, they're vulnerable, they've been exposed to mold somewhere, but they're not really sick right now. And so you can measure these things. VEGF also rises early in mold and then it falls later. VEGF is one of your, it's the ability of your arteries to put oxygen through. So folks with low VEGF are extremely fatigued because they can't get oxygen through. And you measure their pulmonary flow and you measure their ability to exercise, you can show them that they don't exercise well. Uh, and then you can measure various things of lipids for looking at for looking at autoimmune stuff and folks get autoimmune responses and that comes up here with autoimmune responses and those folks you can measure various things but uh, C4A is part of the complement system and C4A pops with mold illness. And folks, their C4A gets higher and higher and higher every time they get sick. So again, that's meant to be under 2830 and serves patients that have an average of 10,000. In Milwaukee, we have no place to measure C4A. LabCorp can't do it, only Quest knows how to measure it, and we can't get the Quest lab here to do it. They say they won't do it, they just won't. So I'm in the process of trying to find a place to get a C4A, we haven't figured it out yet. Um, about that. Yes. So if someone said, because I had one done, so does that mean they, they did it wrong? LabCorp won't do it. It wasn't LabCorp. It was um, the Grafton Hospital. LabCorp sent me to the Grafton Hospital, the LabCorp within the Grafton Hospital. Does that mean they did it wrong? What are you laughing at for? <laughs> <laughs> I have sent off about 50 C4As. Forgive me if I was on to one of you guys. I've been trying to find a place that'll do it. And I've just gotten to the point where I don't, I, they're all normal. They all come back 280. Um, Whereas, too. yeah, <laughs> SIRS has an average of 10,000 average. <coughs> Quest is giving shoemakers there's some disconnect. So in May, I'm going to the, to the national SIRS conference. And I'm going to ask, how do we solve this? Shoemaker says, uh, The, he, I thought that we said the, the folks at the Cleveland Clinic were putting together a lab where we can never we can get it. So I talked to the Cleveland Clinic this week. And they said, oh, no, no, we're not doing it. That's not happening here. So we've got to find a place where we can test C4. Why don't they want to do it? These are very goofy little things. <laughs> These cytokines last ten of thousandths of a second, so measuring them is incredibly delicate. You have to double... It's a huge amount of effort and labor to do it, and then the testing is done in Denver. And so to get a frozen tube that's transported on liquid nitrogen from Milwaukee to Denver ain't easy. So 
There's, it's not a simple process. It's not just a blood test that you can look at. It's the way the specimen's handled, and it's teaching the techs who draw it. It's not the problem with Aurora Healthcare. It's not the problem with ProHealth. It's the problem with the one tech at that one drab station who's never drawn it before in their life, and they don't know, and they don't have liquid nitrogen. Their supervisor never told them about it. They're only used to drawing CBCs and chem panels, and you know PT and INR, so they've never seen these tests before. So I'm hoping. Once we get 50 of us in Milwaukee doing this, then we can maybe, you know, there'll be enough market demand where people start doing it. Um, cheaper to fly to Denver. Or fly to Denver. <laughs> Go to Gen Denver Jewish Hospital and have it done there. Uh, but C4A, for example, highly correlates with brain damage with Alzheimer's. And you can now measure, you can now measure date changes in brain function correlated with C4A, and you can actually see it with an MRI that looks at your uh, lactate glutamate ratios in your brain. So there's all sorts of fascinating technology coming on with imaging that correlates what's going on in your brain. Uh, but C4A probably is the best representative of how sick you are, and we can't measure it in Milwaukee. But it's activation of the innate pathway. Uh, what inflammatory protein goes sky high on third exposure? That would be C4A. Uh, what happens with high TGF beta 1? I don't think I emphasize that enough. I'm sorry, I'm trying to finish this talk up. Remodeling of immune balance makes risk for autoimmune diseases. TGF beta 1 highly correlates with uh, many, many autoimmune diseases. And low VEGF leads to what? And that's fatigue, muscle fatigue and cramps and shortness of breath. And I'm seeing low VEGF all the time. And sure enough, you go and ask somebody, what happens when you exercise? And they say, it takes me a day to get better. I'm in bed for a day. I'm just so fatigued I can hardly do something. I'm just so tired. I lay down for six hours after any exercise. VIP is one of the last hypothalamic hormones. And low levels are found in 98% of patients with SIRS. And actually, if everything else fails, replacing VIP fixes everybody. Once you've gotten the biotoxin out of you, once you've methodically gone through the other steps of treatment and treated the other steps of the pathway, uh, VIP will fix everybody. But you can measure it. Ninety-eight percent of people have it wrong. We'll go through with that. These are just other blood tests. Some people get lots and lots of nosebleeds. Uh, von Willebrand's is an inherited tendency to get nosebleeds or bleeding heavily when you have your teeth pulled. And it's relatively rare, like one in 10,000 people. It's not a common disease. But every internal medicine doctor gets trained about it. And every dentist knows about it, because every now and then they'll have a tooth that doesn't stop bleeding forever. In SIRS, one in 40 people has it. Acquired, acquired von Willebrand's is very common. And these folks come and say, I get a nosebleed every time I leave the house. If I go to the post office, I'll get a nosebleed. Well, the post office is moldy. And they're sitting here in the post office, and by the time they leave the post office, the nose is bleeding, uh, which is sort of interesting. The NeuroQuant MRI is another test you can do that, like I said, it measures. We've just found an MRI scan that will do it up in Richfield. Uh, we're just getting reports back from them. They only just opened up. I've asked two radiology groups in Milwaukee, and both of them said, nah, we're not interested. Uh, I don't know why, but, we're, but we now have the ability to do the NeuroQuant test, and we're going to be going the next step and learning how to do it. And then pulmonary function stress echoes. Uh, Shoemaker believes everybody who feels fatigue should have a pulmonary function test. And what you'll see is a 25-year-old woman who looks absolutely healthy and vibrant and 25 years old, and they get on a stress test, pulmonary function stress test, and they function like an 80-year-old person with congestive heart failure. Oh. And yet they look normal. They look vibrant and healthy and normal, and you can prove that their anaerobic capacity, the, the, the point at which they start burning lactate, their muscles start burning lactate, is extremely low. Whereas a 25-year-old should have quite a robust capacity to do all sorts of things. You can measure that. And so those tests, I don't want to go, that's enough of those tests because we can drive you crazy for a tell and get off the treatment part of it. So, questions? Yes? If you fail on your ERMI test, can you pass on the Hertzman test? <clears throat> no. no. I doubt it. But you might. There must be somebody who slipped through the cracks. Yeah, we've got a score of three on the ERMI, which is above the above two, but the hurts me is eight. He's okay. No, what's your hurts me as well? Eight. 
eight, so which is some. Yeah, you're sort of on the boundary. You're yeah. just just tiptoeing along the edge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, the, sorry. Yes. <laughs> All right. um, is there any correlation to bedwetting? So when the anti-diuretic portion of that, I'm looking at children in specific. Well, this isn't a personal bed, question. No. Bed, bed, no, bedwetting, you know, and, and then... I there has to be. You would think. Children are a whole parent, a whole different specialty <laughs> because they have many fewer symptoms. And their immune system hasn't seen these molds yet. But children do bed wet, and the, the hormone DDADP, we're going to get that. It's an amazing drug. It's a really cool drug. Yes? If you have a, a mold disease caused by whatever, uh, can you get through it and then have it reoccur later? The answer, can you get reoccur? The answer is yes. And every time it reoccurs, it gets worse faster. <coughs> It reoccurs every time with re-exposure, and it'll, it keeps gradually getting, you gradually train your immune system to be more and more and more sensitive. And the human body has natural resilience against it, and so to some degree we, do, we can clean up the stuff a little bit, to some degrees to which we lead a healthy lifestyle. Uh, all those things add up a little bit so you can kind of get away from it, but we're at that point of just learning to learn this process. So I think what we're presenting is the extreme and many people aren't quite so extreme. They're sort of in the 22% that are mo modestly sensitive. And those folks to the level to which they <coughs> limit their exposure and keep themselves cleaned up and whatever. Detox. But let's get on to treatment in a couple minutes. So let's take another five minute break. When it's your house, I've already had two people who have abandoned their homes and moved out. And one was the condo above the, you know, and one person lived on the fourth floor of a condo building, and he was the roof. And he had gotten, a, you know, when you're in a condo, you have to have everybody to agree. And he had had a leaking roof, and he had to get the other three people to agree to help pay for the fixed roof. And so he got a moldy apartment. And that was 10 years ago, and he hasn't been feeling good for five or six years now. Well, he just sold it and got out. The first thing to do is remove from exposure. You have to get rid of the biotoxin, or get away from the biotoxin. And that's easy if you're living, if it's Visteria. Well, Lyme disease is probably easy too. It just takes a couple months of antibiotics. One or two months of antibiotics and you're better. Now, you haven't got rid of the biotoxin yet, but step number one is you've got to whip away from exposure. And that's, as simple as it sounds, it's a very complex decision when you think about your own home. And that's why I wanted you to learn about the ERMI test and the Hertzme test, because that's a way of measuring your home. And so ERMI testing is an algorithm to calculate the ratio of water-damaged species to common indoor mold and the resulting score. So no level, the tricky thing with mold is recognizing that your immune system, for those who are exquisitely sensitive, no level of exposure is safe. It's not a level of dose it's a level of exposure. Because once your immune system, once you knock over the domino, it doesn't matter if it's one domino or 50 dominoes. If you've knocked it over, you start the cascade. So it's not the function of, the, it's what that cascade being started. Once aggravated and activated, the tiniest exposure can result in overwhelming response. And in Shoemaker's books, you'll read about people, who, kids who go away to school and and every, you know, college campuses have 10 buildings. Five of them are over 100 years old. And kids will go from one school building to the next, and they can tell you exactly which building they're in that's OK and which one isn't. And that, that's what those folks who are exquisitely sensitive feel that kind of sensitivity. Or people will come in and say, I feel symptoms within 10 minutes. I start feeling uncomfortable. I don't feel good. I can tell. I go to a wedding and I'm sitting in the front row and I go to my spouse and say, I don't feel good here. I can tell it. Once you get sensitized to it, you can start telling that difference. And it's emphatically not dose related, it's exposure related, which makes it difficult. So the question is, you've got to be militant and start being, you've got to be thorough. We've got to, we've got to get to the bottom of it. So step number two. 
is we've got to get the poison out of you. You first have to get the biotoxin out of you. And this is what's easy. This is cholestyramine. Their immune system can't see it, but this is merry ground number one. You've got this biotoxin, whatever it is. It's something, because it comes out of you when you take cholestyramine. But it's circulating and setting off your immune function and circulating and setting off your immune function. Cholestyramine binds it perfectly. Now, some people initially said you had to run up for seven days with fish oil before taking it. So we want, and so folks who've taken fish oil already, I say, I'll just go ahead and get started. But he's not been emphasizing that recently. And Shoemaker also says everybody should be on a low amylose diet the whole way through this. Now, what's in a low amylose diet? <laughs> what is it? Uh, no root vegetables and basically no grains. No I mean, grains. You're off of grains completely. So, and you know? And then so green leafy, anything that grows above the ground. Right. Eat lots of it, tons. Um, so yeah. Shoemaker comes out with low amylose diet in 2002. He wrote a book called Lose the Weight You Hate. Okay? But if you read Shoemaker's book, and then read Gundry's book published in 2017, and Gundry says, you want to eat a low lectin diet. And the low lectin diet turns out to be the low amylose diet updated. Okay, so that's how science works. You know, we work with, you go a little here and a little here and a little here and a little here, but you're all moving forward. And what you realize is that the low lectin diet and it's that lectin pathway that we're setting off the complement system. So as a general rule, if you're trying to get the toxin out of you, we want you on a low lectin diet, which is all grains, all root vegetables, all nightshades, so which means you get to fast for months at a time and not eat anything. <laughs> and if you want to simplify it, just keto. Just yep. go keto. Right. keto. So, grains, so it's diet. basically all the olive oil, all the coconut oil you yes. want, and all the green leafy vegetables. So the broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts mm -hmm. are all magnificent for you. Those are fine foods. Another potent lectin that we haven't talked about is milk from black cows. <laughs> Brown cow milk is A2 milk. A1 cows are, and so as we now know, uh, this is where Gundry says, A1 milk is the most potent predictor of a society rate of autism, or a society's rate of schizophrenia, or a society's rate of coronary artery disease, are all correlated more highly with how much A1 milk we drink. So does anybody here using A2 milk? Have you heard about this at all? Have you heard about it? The only place you can buy it in Milwaukee is at Myers Grocery Store and at Outpost and Health Hunt. Or at Slowpokes, at Slowpokes up in Mecklenburg. There's a store bag for it. There's a store bag. Really? Yeah. They've got it now too? Yep. Oh, good for them. And how do they label yeah. it? It's A1 milk, no, pardon? How do they, how do they label it? How do you know it's A1? Yeah. If they don't, if they, if it doesn't, if it costs less than seven dollars uh, <laughs> an ounce, <laughs> if they won't. So, so when you say black cows, are you talking Holsteins? Yes. Okay. Holstein, Wisconsin's dairy herd is A1. Uh, New Zealand has taken all their Holsteins and completely bred the A1 gene out of them. So New Zealand has safe milk. Australia has safe milk. Uh, the A2 company, they call it A2 milk. And the A2 milk company was the number one stock in the world last year. Uh, it just rocketed up because the, the, the awareness of it is spreading. And everybody who has a kid with autism in their family will tell you, oh yeah, I'm going to take my kid off milk, he does better. Now we're realizing it's not that he has to take him off A1 milk, all milk, he has to take him off A1 milk. It's A2 milk he can have. Or goat milk, goat milk's fine, sheep milk is fine, camel milk is fine, donkey milk is fine. Human milk is fine, but in Wisconsin we only have about a hundred dairy farmers who are converting, and that. But A1 milk is a potent lectin, so okay. He wants you on the lectin-free diet, and then the cholesterol. I mean, the dose is one scoop four times a day. 
15 minutes before a meal. Cholestyramine, one scoop four times a day. And it's a basically, it's a binding drug and you take it so it's in your stomach before you eat and then you eat a meal and your gallbladder squeezes down and squirts your bile into your gut and the cholestyramine meets your bile and after three or four days, the toxin's out of you. If you're living in a safe place. What if you don't have a problem? Doesn't matter. Oh, you're, you still have the, the sphincter muscle at your pancreas gland is still shut and it opens in response to when you eat. So the bile then comes out into your gut in a rush. So you just want the cholestyramine in your gut as food comes down. And so you'll bind it up. And the only risk of cholestyramine is it turns your guts into concrete. And so for those of you who are very fond of, of, of rare occasional bowel movements, that's fine. But most of us like to poop. You know, I poop today t-shirts, you know. <laughs> well, the older we get, the more we obsess about it. Yeah. You know? And so we don't want you constipated. We want you pooping. So what you do is you also buy some. Actually, they've got some here. And MD Custom, they got some wonderful assistant Aloe. stuff. Yeah. What is it? You've got the aloe. The aloe, aloe, super aloe. Super aloe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. work wonderful. So you've got the aloe stuff here that works. I've sent a couple yeah. people here to get the aloe stuff. Yeah. Or you can buy some various forms of Miralax or mm -hmm. extra magnesium or magnesium citrate. Or yep. Dan will help you out with any of those things. <laughs> but you need to be proactive before you get horribly constipated. <clears throat> That's the only side effect. Now, Except some people taking cholestyramine for confounding reasons will herx if they have Lyme disease. And so some people feel worse when they start on cholestyramine, which is just terribly confounding. Uh, and so those folks then have to drop back five yards, get on the no amylose diet, get rid of every lectin in your body, so you're really cutting your lectin exposure to nothing, and get on lots and lots of extra fish oil and after five days, start the cholestyramine again. Uh, so four times a day, 15 minutes before a meal. Well call has one-fifth or one-quarter the number of binding sites as cholestyramine. It's gentler, but you have to take it for four times longer, and it costs you $700 a month, and your insurance won't pay for it. Well call is another binding drug that's a prescription drug, but it's 10 times as expensive. How long? Okay, four times a day for... Uh, people have taken cholestyramine for 30 years for cholesterol. Of course, it wasn't working very well for them. Uh, <laughs> and it does very few side effects except for constipation. So you can take cholestyramine forever. If you're living in a dirty home, you might want to say, until I get the house cleaned up, I should take cholestyramine continuously. Shoemaker says, everybody who's ever had any kind of mold exposure, if they've gone through the effort of cleaning themselves up, should have a stash of cholestyramine at home, and if for them going out is dangerous, they should take, anytime they leave their house, they should take their cholestyramine so it's in them, so that anything that's going out, they've got it in them. And if they have another exposure of any kind, they should take it for three days. So in some of Col uh, uh, Shoemaker's story, books, he tells about clients who are exquisitely sensitive to mold toxins, who just get used to taking it. They feel, oh, four or five times a year, they take cholestyramine for four or five days whenever they get re-exposed. You got invited to somebody's house for Thanksgiving dinner, and you get in that house, and you don't feel so good, and it's not polite to leave right away. So as soon as you get home, you're getting yourself on cholestyramine for four more days before you set off all the inflammatory things. Break that cycle before all those merry-grounds get going. You know, we want to catch it early. Pardon? Is it a prescription? It is a prescription, okay. and uh, it and, shouldn't and, be. And pharmacists need to be educated as to its mold use instead of its cholesterol use. Well, yeah, so every, your yeah. insurance only pays for cholesterol use, mm -hmm. and they only let you have one can a month because that's the dose for a month of cholesterol, which is insanity. And so the pharmacist will say to you, I'll write for three refills, and the pharmacist will say to you, well, you can't have a second refill. Four times a day, you're only... Can is only going to last you 10 days. Now, about 10% of people are exquisitely sensitive to cholestyramine, all the artificial sweeteners in it. At which point, you call me up and we call up Dan, and Dan will make it for you absolutely pure, clean, 
So of course, it costs more because it's hard to get that. You have to source it and get the pure cold styramine, which has absolutely no sweeteners. And I think my rumor has it sort of on the order of library pays. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, it's slightly, yeah. yes. The pure stuff. But Shoemaker doesn't treat anybody with the commercial stuff. He makes everybody take the pure stuff. He says, it's not worth my time wasting my time finding out it doesn't work. Right. And I may come to that, but right now I'm still trying the commercial stuff for a while. But Dan is waiting for me to give up because he says he can give you all the clothes and everything he needs. <laughs> because that may be useful. It may be, I, I, I'm still at that point of trying to, feel, I'm feeling sorry for people and how much it costs because it's more expensive. And I'm trying to go as cheap as I can. I have many people saying, I can't afford it. I can, this is expensive. So, so like, you know. What is the pure cost? What? 350 bucks. Mm, that's not too. I mean, that's that's a hundred dollars more than what it's costing yeah. to get the under. Because it's about 250. For a uh, thousand grams. Yeah, it's just yeah. crazy to me. Yeah. Oh, for 11. Yeah. For 11 grams. Thousand. 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 Oh, okay, good. Okay, okay. But that equates to how much of the quest gram. Okay. And that's just so it just costs more. Probably but you know, so people have. People have to make economic decisions all the time, so we'll figure that out. But at the end of the day, if you aren't getting better, we have to get the pure stuff. Well, and it works. It works. It works. Uh, and Lyme patients, I mentioned, may have to be on Actos for a week or people this week. This is what colostromy looks like when you find it. Uh, this is what the molecule looks like, because I'm a biology, a chemistry major, I have to show you the molecule. This is where it binds it. This is just millions of molecules long. It's just long, long, long chains of it. And again, the low amylose diet means no root vegetables, no peanuts, no bananas, no rice, no wheat, no rye, no barley, which is basically low lectin food. Okay? The nuance, uh, if at home and feeling well, can you stop? Well, I have to tell you one example. I have a 70-year-old woman come to see me, a 75-year-old woman from Sheboygan, who when her husband died at age 70, uh, she grieved and mourned. They'd lived, you know, been married for 50 years. And at 72, she was lonely, so she volunteered at her thrift shop at her church. And she was put in charge of used clothing. Where does used clothing come from? <laughs> Your basement. After a month, she was so sick, she couldn't go back to work. She brings me a milk carton of records after having seen 15 doctors over three years at the Sheboygan Clinic. And she was sick, and her HLA testing was super positive, and we gave her cholesteramine, and we never saw her again. And about four months later, I saw her daughter, and I said, how's your mom doing? And her daughter said, oh, she loves you. <laughs> she took that stuff for a week and said, I'm good, and she quit. She felt great, she felt back, she was normal. And she says, she's now told 100,000 people in Sheboygan County about you. You should have a shuttle bus going up there because everybody up there wants to come down and see you who has mold because she's back to normal. And she, for three years, she saw all these doctors who kept patting her on the back and saying, you're just getting mold, you're just getting old, honey. And she's a vibrant 70-year-old, which is what we want you to be. But, you know. So... Um, about 50% of U.S. buildings have mold. You may need to take prophylactic cholesteramine if exposed to take it for at least three days. If sensitive to sugar, talk to Dan, because you may be super sensitive to some sweeteners. And if that's it, I'm sorry, but we've got to find a better way of doing it. And if constipation works, you know, Miralax works, you can put a little bit of mag sulfate or some Miralax in with it and soften up. Number three, eradicate <coughs> Marcons. So Marcons gets in your nose, to 98% of people with low MSH, you got to clean up Marcons. Topical and ordinary body. We've been giving Beg Spray, uh, which is Bas which is Bactroban or Mupiracin, EDTA, and Gentamicin. And just last Friday, Shoemaker told me, no, 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 you only need the EDTA. Well, I kept wrote. I tried to write a confirming email. I'm now on the list, sir, and nobody answered me. I said, why? And I got a big flat echo and nobody answered <coughs> on the listserv. So I've written a couple prescriptions of just plain ED, of just EDTA because that's what breaks up the biofilm and you know I'm trying to find out does that work just as well. If it works just as well it's fine. So Dan you may be sending more prescriptions for just EDTA or I may give up because if I see EDTA failing <coughs> I may go back to 
do the whole thing. So is that, is that a nasal spray then? It's a nasal spray. You take two squirts three times a day. Blow your nose first, two squirts three times a day. Now, initially, it would start out with oral rifampicin too for a month. And so when I was starting, I was writing for some rifampin. But they don't do that, and nobody's doing that anymore. So fair enough. If it's just EDTA, we'll try that. I want to see if it works. The nuance is, again, if you start killing it off, some people get these Herxheimer reactions. And we're not sure why that happens, but some people just don't feel good for a couple of days. There's lots more research needs to be done, a lot more science. Start the veg <coughs> oil, high dose fish oil, low amylose diet. And if on top of that, if you can tolerate actose, then we'll give you actose. And I'm going to give two more steps, I'll tell you about actose. Okay. Uh, more nuance. If you keep having EDT, if you keep having Marcon's recurrent, the one alternative carrier to humans is the nose of dogs. Can you imagine doing beg spray to your dog? <laughs> I don't think there's enough bacon in the world. <laughs> so, <laughs> turns out the dogs, doesn't that look like a beautiful dog? <laughs> but apparently dogs can carry Marcons in their noses. And dogs are also, must, I'm wondering if dogs can get sirs. I don't know. You know that lazy dog in your house that never does anything? Maybe that poor guy has sirs. <laughs> Who knows? We share like 98% of, no, 95% of genes of dogs are the same. So whatever. Pop quiz. What are the first three treatment steps? Remove. Remove toxin. Clean up markup. What three drugs are used in these three steps? Steg spray, maybe just EDTA. Okay. How long does it take to do these steps? Oh, about one month each, if you can do full dose. If you fail to clear Marcon's, what you should ask about? The dog. Okay. Treatment step number four. Fix anticleodin. If you measure antibodies on everybody, just about everybody has some sort of wheat allergy antibody. A huge number of people have wheat antibodies. <clears throat> and why is that happening? Because you're having low MSH, which happens, what happens to the membrane in your stomach, in your gut? It's damaged, and so lectin-containing foods can get into you more easily, and wheat is the archetype lectin food. So I meant to measure gliadin antibodies. I haven't been seeing as much of that. Shoemaker contends that quite a few people have it, and I just haven't seen enough. And his contention is get folks off wheat. Just don't bother. Stop that lectin load. And <clears throat> only he doesn't call it the lectin load. He calls it the amylose load. And I think he believes <clears throat> in the amylose. I'm eager to hear in May what if, if he's had an attitude adjustment and agrees maybe it's lectins after all. And that was his, that was his first idea. But, they overlap 95% anyways. Uh, but I've been measuring antibodies, and I haven't seen folks. Now, if folks have TTG antibodies, they probably need to be off gluten forever. Other folks just need to be off for a couple of months while your gut heals. Okay. Uh, so all forms of bread, all forms of gluten, all forms of wheat set you on. Next step is androgens. Fix low androgens. Shoemaker's argument is that every man who's got low testosterone needs to be checked for mold sensitivity first. <coughs> well, $1,500 a lab, I get a bad attitude out of a fair number of people who say, no, no, I don't want to do all that, just give me the testosterone. But in fact, an awful lot of people do have, an awful lot of men with SIRS have low ADH, but so do a lot of women have a whole lot of low androgens. And those folks oftentimes have lack of energy, no libido, and if you measure their DHEA, they're quite low. And I've been telling people forever, oh, your DHEA is low because you have adrenal fatigue. And I'm going, oops, low DHEA and low ACTH actually <coughs> might just be mold illness. And we're recognizing, oh, we've got a combination of what I've been doing. So up, he says upregulated aromatose enzyme makes for low testosterone and higher estrogen. And his treatment is give DHEA three times a day and measure it and then give HCG for a month. And he says what you'll find is once the toxin's out of somebody, 
men will make their own testosterone. So I'm now starting to look for men who are willing to do that, but I'm measuring their DHEA, I'm measuring LH and DHEA just to see that, even though I'm not measuring the whole mold picture for men who come to me for testosterone. And, or he says VIP spray will fix everybody. All right. Uh, next step is treat ADH osmolality. How do we treat ADH osmolality? Fix low ADH. And this person, what's the primary symptom they're going to tell you? person with low ADH is going to have what? They'll be peeing 20 times a day. Right. So how do you fix it? It's very simple. You give them a pill called DDAVP or Desmopressin 0.2 every other night for 10 nights. 10 days. Fixed. And DDAVP is a treatment for kids who are bedwetters. That's what it's on the market for. It's DDAVP is on the market for bedwetting children. You give it to them at, so I've now given it to probably 200 people. And I say, oh, just try the experiment. If you're peeing 10 times a day and it just feels often to you, take one pill and see if you pee four, pee four times a day. And I've had a bunch of people say, oh my gosh, it makes quite a difference. Some people say it doesn't make much difference. It corrects that dysfunction in just a few doses. You only have to take it three or four times and you're back to normal. So you can treat people for just 10 days and they're fixed. It's like the meter. It's like, it's like going to the fuse box and just flipping the fuse box and, and resetting it. It resets wonderfully. So the nuance is the sweat glands try to help you out and your skin gets more salty and you get increased number of shocks. And a fair number of people, I've now found one person who's been everywhere in America for horrible, horrible, horrible headaches and her DDAVP was off the charts. She was way abnormal. I haven't seen her back yet to see if her headaches got better. And it's DDAVP. DDAVP. It's a cheap pill. It's not real expensive. And you only take it for five doses. It's a prescription. Pardon? Over the counter? It's a prescription. Now what's fascinating is DDAVP also mobilizes the von Willebrand's coagulation factors. And people who have exquisite nosebleeds will tell you they never leave the house without DDAVP because if they go into a place where they get exposed, the first thing that happens is they get a nosebleed within 20 minutes. Whereas if they take the DDAVP right away, the nosebleed stops right away. So for folks who are having lots of nosebleeds, they want the DDAVP not for the peeing, but to stop their nosebleeds. So, but that's, that's a relatively uncommon person. High MMP9. High MMP9, this is the summary medication, this is the summary test of how your cytokine effects are going on. And you treat it with actose and a low amylose diet. And actose is an old diabetes drug. It was on the market for, it's been on the market for 20 years. And it lowers your MMP9 by lowering your PPAR system, which is part of your inflammatory pathway down to the gene level. This is gene treatment. Actose changes your genes. You're literally changing your genes by changing your PPAR activating system that sets off MMP9. So you put folks on p for a month on a low amylose diet. Now you can only do it if their leptin is high. And what's fascinating is in mold patients, many, many people, what's your leptin for? What's your lept, what does your leptin normally do for you? Do you know? It says your appetite's had enough to eat. Stop eating. And basically it says, you've had enough to eat, you don't need to eat anymore, stop eating. When you get overweight, your leptin, you become leptin resistant. And many overweight people will have leptins of, they should, they should be under 10, and they'll have a leptin of 16 or 18 because they're overweight. With mold, they'll have a leptin of 70, 50, way high, off the charts high, which means their fat cells are locked so tight they are in, you know, absolute confinement. I mean, they're just they're locked down. You can't lose weight when your leptin is sky high. So for those of you who've had trouble losing weight and are puzzled, if you measure your MMP9, it's going to be high. And you take Actos for a month, and your MP9 goes to normal, and your leptin comes down to normal, 
and suddenly you start losing weight. So I have a member of my church who sits next to me, at, or close to me in church, who says to me, it's working. <laughs> the pioglitazone is a charm, it's like a miracle drug. No animal is driving pioglitazone, away she goes. Okay? So that works like a charm to lower, get your up to you. What happened there? Oh no. Oh, I was playing with it. I'm sorry. The exit effects. Oh. Nuance, if you're left in the below seven, you can't do it. You can't tolerate people that's on, you may be able to drop back on just the amylose free diet and just get on the amylose free diet. So the next step is fix VEGF. And, oops, I'm sorry, high C3A. Now the tricky thing is I can't measure C3A and C4A. That requires a Quest lab test, and we're now in the conundrum of trying to figure out where to do it. But basically, C3A is that complement pathway where you're constantly sick. And high C3A predicts Lyme disease, but folks who have their complement pathway constantly being reignited, you can lower it with statins. Statins dramatically lower C3A. And that suddenly struck me as maybe thinking, oh my gosh, is that what statins are really doing? We've been taking statins all this time, thinking they fix cholesterol. And it has nothing to do with cholesterol. This is the inflammatory pathway that statins work on. And we don't have the ability to measure it precisely yet, but I think that's probably what's going to turn out to be the truth. And really, we've been doing, we found, that they, yeah, they sort of lower cholesterol too, but where they're really being effective is lowering C3A. We've now found the marker, and we're going to have to get a better technology of how to measure it going forward from that. But if you're on a statin, you've got to be on CoQ10 for a couple days ahead of time. And you may get all sorts of side effects, for, but you can lower C3A to normal in a month. If folks have high C3A and you can measure it, you can prove it's better in a month if you can measure it. The problem is we can't measure it yet, so I'm, I'm going to have to figure out that conundrum. C4A is another one that you want to fix. And C4A gets better if you get folks <coughs> Procrit. And Procrit is what you give, you know, for in leuke when folks are having uh, chemotherapy, you give folks Procrit to keep their blood counts up. Well, it's a relatively expensive drug, but it's also like number one, or number three drug in America in terms of dollars spent on, on, because there's so many people on chemotherapy, they're getting Procrit every month. It turns out to be a brilliant drug to affect C4A. And C4A, if I could measure it, is the measure of how sick you are with that's really the measure of how sick you are with exposure. And C4 is what explodes when you get re-exposed and re-exposed, you know, re-exposed. Mm -hmm. And we just can't measure it, so we can't go anywhere with it. And Procrit uh, got Shoemaker in trouble because he had enough people say, what are you giving that for, for mold? And he got a state review board and all that kind of crazy stuff. So, but you can measure there's other ways of fixing uh, C4A, and probably we're getting back to saying we've got to get back on the low amylose diet and high dose fish oil. And you're trying to, the fish oil is giving you the building blocks to turn off inflammation. So it's just a remote way of getting back to the turn off inflammation. You know, and so the Procrit idea is there, but it may not be a viable pattern. So you have to go, VIP will fix it also. So we're going to get to VIP in a minute. So TGF-beta-1 is step number penultimate, one more to go. And fixing TGF-beta-1 turns out to be relatively easy too. It's one month of Losartan, blood pressure pill. One more time, we're doing gene therapy. One month therapy with Losartan, and your TGF-beta-1 will go to normal. Well, TGF-beta-1 is what's driving autoimmune diseases. Anybody who's got autoimmune diseases probably ought to be thinking about, should I think about how to do that? We want to get TGF-beta-1 to normal. It should be measured and gotten to normal, and you can take a blood pressure med to do it. So just this last week, I saw a person who's taking a congener, a, a cousin of, of uh, Losartan, and he comes in and his TGF-beta-1 is like 1,000, normal, very much in the normal range. And I'm going through his meds, and I said, oh, look at that. How long have you been taking that? He said, about 10 years. He says, I feel much better when I'm taking it. He's been taking it for 10 years for his blood pressure. And I thought, I thought, of course, he's been lowering his TGF-beta-1. 
he hasn't gotten rid of the toxin, but at least he's got his TGF beta 1 down. You know. Last step, VIP. This is where I'm going to need your help, Dan. I'm getting to the point where I now have people who need VIP. And the rumor is it only works if your ERMI score is below 2 and your Hertz means, oopsie daisy, below 10. It doesn't work if you have, don't have Marcons, if you still have Marcons. So if you have Marcons or high ERMIs, you're not going to fix it. And your VCS test has to be normal. So if these three things are back to normal, one spray, four, that means you've gotten the toxin out of you. One spray four times a day fixes everybody. What's it stand for? Vasoactive intestinal peptide. It was discovered as the hormone that your gut puts out to make you put juice into your gut. Like melanocyte stimulating hormone. You don't care about juice in your gut. That's not the issue. But it's none of one of those hypothalamic uh, peptides that has an effect, a hormonal effect on everything in your brain. And it fixes everybody. When we say 100% of people get fixed, it fixes everybody if you're in a clean house. The problem is, is it costs $4,000 a month. Uh, that's the problem. But folks who feel fatigue will have almost instant improvement in their pulmonary artery pressure for their low veg ed, when you can't be able to fix up in that. You, it's like almost instant fix. I have not treated anybody with it yet. I am looking forward to it. All my colleagues around the country say they, treat, it's, a, they say it's a miracle drug. You only take it for a month. It's not forever. So it's not like $4,000 a month forever. It's a $4,000 treatment, which anybody who's gotten an MRI scan once, you paid $4,000 for. So you know, you, you've spent $4,000 on other stupid things in your life, and this is a good one. So this might be the cure, and the nuance is, is that it has to be American-made VIP. Foreign-made VIP doesn't work, and the shoemaker says it just doesn't work. So do drug plans cover it? Or a portion of it? Drug, scan, drug plans don't cover getting an MSH blood level. No, none of that. Unfortunately, none of it. And until we raise, so what needs to happen? I just, for example, yesterday I wrote a letter to uh, a woman's health care system here in Milwaukee who was complaining that they wouldn't allow her to get an HLA, the HLA tissue typing or blood test. So I went onto Shoemaker's website and I downloaded his, his, uh, literature references for why the HLA works, and it's 12 pages long of references, single spaced, yeah. and I sent them all 12 pages. And said, so if you guys want to read the literature, here's the literature on why the HLA works, but their medical review committee can look through those articles and say, tell me it doesn't work, because I just sent them uh, something like 790 articles. <laughs> but right now, it doesn't fit into the standard pattern of traditional drug treatment, and we're seeing that kind of level of resistance. Uh, and so until we break through that level of resistance, it's not going to be paid for. So treatment plan nuance. Cholesterol, cholesterol is invented for cholesterol binding. Use it away from food four times a day. can be constipating. Uh, well call also works quite well. Limes and biotoxins sometimes make you herx if you're having biotoxins. Other biotoxins, you don't live with them, so it's easy to get them out of you once they're out of you. So the summary of the cascade, biotoxin <laughs> enters your body, it causes inflammation, particularly in fat cells and in your brain, the cytokines travel to your hypothalamus and damage the leptin receptor, leptin gets elevated, you get fat, lowers MSH production, you get pain, you get fatigue, you get foggy brain, you get lousy guts, and that cytokines then start feeding you to all sorts of goofy, achy, sore feeling, and then it becomes self-sustaining. That's the disease SIRS, and this disease is fixable. Questions?